<laughs> Hello. I uh, I think that was a there's a slightly longer delay to YouTube tonight than usual, so I apologize that um people have to put up with that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that was a cross between Doctor Who theme and a spaghetti western. What was it the was, um... um Bird of Prey in the end. Bird of Prey. Um uh, I can't remember who does the original. Someone in the live chat can let us know, but it was the Fat Boy Slim version that was in my mind. It was going to be the ah. Doctor Who theme and slowly worked its way towards um, Bird of Prey. <laughs> yeah, what's the do 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 do? Can't remember what that theme is. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, horrible reverb, out of tune whistling. This is episode three of our Tardis based live streams um, with Chris Meyer. How are you, Chris? I'm doing really well. Um, much better now that the system's up and running. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, it's nice to, to get over the tech and start playing. Yeah. So this series of um, kind of mini series of live streams, Feeding the TARDIS and Patching the TARDIS, which is today, follows on from Feeding the Monster, which is the Monster Studio case. We went into power, bus bars, quite high-end power system, huge modular case, module choices, and then we went on to patching the monster system with examples, and I can link that in the live chat in a second. Um, and we've also done two TARDIS-based live streams, feeding the TARDIS, so building up this 12U system, which we can take a quick look at straight away. So we built up the bottom section, looking at note generation, mixing this acoustic input, stage and then we had rhythms drums and effects in the top section but today is going to be focused on patching how you actually patch and play this with examples to go with it yeah so what we we didn't really touch on this at the start but it's been part of the streams as, as we've gone along but for anyone that's maybe joined this one first what's the goal of this system what are you trying to achieve with a this 12u live case yeah this is the system that i take out whenever i go play live or play with somebody else. And the original intention of the system was for me to go jam with other people and to take on the role of the drummer. Back when I lived in LA, I had this system that consisted of Ableton Live, a hard drive, a laptop, and two 90 pound, you know, few foot cube racks of gear I used to bring with me as my live setup. And there came a need um, about a year and a half ago to be able to fly back to LA to do a gig, and I said, I'm not flying with two 90-pound racks of gear. So let's see if I can recreate what I used to do in modular. So the focus of this case is very percussion and rhythm-oriented. But I've been given opportunities to place the occasional solo piece or solo set. So I've also been trying to add more melodic capabilities to the system as well. So the bottom half has the sequencer and the synth voice in addition to an acoustic input section, while the top half is very much rhythm generation and percussion sound modules. Yeah. Um so you do perform with others as well, but you do perform on your own. When you, before we get into these patch examples, what's the mindset for that? Because you've, of course, got to leave more room when other people are involved. You're, it's, a, it's a whole different experience for anyone that's played in an ensemble or improvised setting with others before. But you don't change setup for that, which I found interesting before we went into this, that it, it's the same case to facilitate. It's, it's the same case, yeah. I wanted one case... Another requirement is that it fits on carry-on in U.S. airlines, but it's somewhat easy, somewhat easy for me to load in and set up as well. Yeah, it, it evolved. It originally was supposed to be play with others' case, but I wanted to be able to do at least an ambience or a drone or something like that as well in the system. And so I had a minimal synth voice to begin with, but yeah, I just grew out the synth voice and said, look, let's make this flexible enough that it can cover all of this territory. I can go improvise with others. Um, when I play with Meridian Alpha, we actually have somewhat composed pieces that have a lot of improvisational elements in it, need to be able to execute those, but also to do the occasional solo piece as well. And I really, you know, kind of put it to the test at the end of last year when I got to do the um, Data Cold Audio, and all those pieces were done on this live system in real time because the monster was busy being rebuilt at the time. Hmm. Yeah. I'm slightly thrown off by... Uh, <laughs> the live chat but just wondering uh, and endless wondering um this fits we <laughs> spoke about this before that this does you say u.s airline travel it seems yeah. too big for european travel has it been across yeah a lot europe of yet? 
it has not been to Europe yet. Um, toyed with the idea of bringing it to Monster Meat Leeds, but that's not going to happen, unfortunately. Um, you really have to go check out individual airlines and even airplanes as to what their carry-on luggage requirements are and what the restrictions are. When you do something like, you know, you know, EasyJet or one of the cheap flights, they tend to be like you can put maybe your purse up there and that's about it. But on the other hand, British Airways, for example, had very generous overhead. I figured if I could book British Airways out, I could actually bring this in the overhead. But the other little kink is that, you know, our modulars are musical instruments. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of airline regulations, particularly in the U.S., about allowing musical instruments on board. If there is room in the cabin, they are supposed to make room for it in most cases. Yeah. Again, you have to check airline by airline. The U.S. has a rule for everybody. I've not pulled that card yet where I said, this is a musical instrument. You have to take it, that no one's questioned me putting it in an overhead bin yet. But I know when people like Richard Devine travel, who has a lot more gear than I do, he really does use the uh, musical instrument card to get it onto airplanes. Yeah. Um, there was a point in the chat, just someone asking for me to turn my mic gain up. I am riding a mute button for the sake of me hammering away on the keyboard. It was quite loud in the previous stream. So if I disappear, um, call me an idiot, tell me to unmute it. If I am too quiet or too loud, or Chris is, or the examples that follow, just let us know. We can make adjustments live. It looks like yeah. we're somewhat even in level. So if it's fine, let us know. If it's not, let us know too. The thing I was going to ask that I was throwing myself in the live chat, is there anyone <laughs> anywhere we can check out Meridian Alpha? collaboration that you have with jim um there is a meridian alpha youtube channel that has a couple live performances maybe maybe even just one on it i've not had a chance to put all the performances up there but i will dig out that link and add it to the comments worst case later on but there is a meridian alpha youtube channel okay i'll leave you to do that i can pin that comment for anyone that watches back live i can pin it as the, the top comment uh, to save so Getting into this, what's the first thing? What's the first thing you patch? It might not be the first example we have today, but as soon as we, you had this yeah. set up after the live stream, what's the first thing that you want or are most excited to to play with in the system? Well, the, the first thing for this particular system is not all that exciting, um, <laughs> and it, I call it the backbone patch. When I show up somewhere to play, I don't want to spend an hour patching it, um, and there's a fair amount of patching that stays the same no matter what I'm doing okay. in terms of routing clocks around, routing my effects sends, getting the percussion modules into the mixer, the acoustic section, blah, 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 blah. Um, so the first thing I do is I put together this 40, 50 cable backbone patch. And right now it's a bit on the loose side, but usually I wire tie it down really tightly so I can close the lid with that backbone intact. That way, when I go somewhere, I just open up the lid. The basics are all there, and it's literally just like this pattern generator to this sound module. I have I have a sound. Okay. I have effects. I'm in sync. I'm ready to go. Okay. And that'll be the first thing we're, we're discussing. Actually, I want to go over what that backbone patch is, and then we'll go into a couple music examples. Yeah. So as I pull across, um, let's take a look at that as we move over. That's this bottom left section of the case well actually throughout the case um let me go ahead and while you've got that up get the real system ready to go it's throughout the, the yellow cables in the middle right that go in between the effects units and the mixer are part of the backbone patch in the upper left corner around the pamela's new workout and the grids there's a lot of synchronization going on that's always there and then there's stuff happening in the lower right corner that also has a lot of pitch routing and also the um, so-called acoustic section. And let's go ahead and we'll bring a camera up on that lower right section. Yeah. Um, a few people in the chat saying I'm a little bit quieter. There's about another 4 dB of level across some processing and my input stage. That should be better. Bear in mind you are just over 30 seconds uh, delayed from us. So if I type at someone, is this better? And you immediately say, no, you won't have heard the effect of me making those adjustments yet. So just bear with us. Um, it seems okay when I can listen it back. You can hear both of us, but continue to let me know if there's any issues. Um, also, just to mention with the live chat, um, I'm watching. 
we are watching, obviously, as I'm responding to people. Any questions that aren't kind of immediately on topic with what we're discussing, I'm going to pull out into a document. So there's a question there from Jeff Check about talking about burst generators. I'll pull that out and we'll come back and, and talk about burst generators. Anything other than Jeff's comment that I've missed, please type it again. And from now, I'm going to start copying these across into a document. So let's have a look across. There we go. Yeah, the now I've got the lower left of my system in here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where a lot of different pitch routing happens. So I do color code my cables where white is pitch, yellow is audio, the pink or red is gates, and the blue is modulation. So that's another way to kind of tell apart from this mess of cables what's going on. Oh, and green is master clocks and synchronization. So I have a few things going on, such as pitch coming into a clavis caltrans, where I've calibrated a couple of my oscillators. From the caltrans, it does transposition into a buffered molt, where I can do further transposition from another source, such as my sequencer down the other corner, then off to the oscillators and into rings. In the acoustic section, I've got the input from my Folk Tech Nano Garden that we'll play with here in a little bit. Um, but then the audio comes into a Pico mod, which is an AD envelope generator and a VCA. That's basically my noise gate. And then that audio comes into a splitter, so I can split dry signal off to my mixer or signal off into my rings, then into the rings. So things like that are pre-patched. Gates, when the envelope follower in my input interface, the Bifaco instrument interface, goes off, I need that trigger to do several different things. So I've got one part of this multiple here going off and triggering sample and holds, the um, SSF div kit step random, to go ahead and freeze pitch voltages coming into it, but also play around with triggering new modulations to send to other modules. A copy of it goes off to trigger rings, a copy of it goes off to trigger the sequencer down here to go ahead and step it along. I actually have the sequencer on an on-off button. This is a Maleco performance mult, so I can step the sequencer or not step the sequencer. So those are things I don't need to repatch every time I go out to a gig. Same with the audio around the oscillators. I have a braids. You might have noticed since we did the feeding the TARDIS, I did get a micro braids too um, from warp circuits, having fun playing around with that. Paired it up with the Clavis twin waves. Both of those come through a tuner, my stroboscopic tuner here from Noise Engineering, into a mixer, including sub-octave. Then they go into the filter, and the filter then is pre-patched into the VCA and out. So a lot of that stuff can be pre-patched. Um, let me go up into the top part here so you can see some of the sync, and then we'll talk about the audio. So excuse me while we do a little bit of camera shift here. There we go. Oh, yeah, I can get all that in one shot. Great. The brain of the system is a panel's new workout. That's my master tempo. I do have a Pamela expander underneath it that used to send out DIN sync and MIDI sync to other people I'm playing with. I can also bring in DIN sync into Pamela to follow other people's clock. And I also use a circuit happy missing link to follow other people using Ableton who may not have CV tools. But then those clocks get distributed to several different places. There's a 24 pulse per quarter note that's driving grids. There's a programmable one, 16th notes or whatever I want, driving Euclidean circuits. I'm taking advantage of the 16th note breakout down here off of Pamela's expander to drive several different things in the system. This cable goes off to drive my 1010 Music black box, which has all my sample loops into it, but also drives the Cara, which is a version of Marbles. It goes off and drives the 4MS DLD down here. It also even drives LFO that's built into the Clavis twin waves down here. So all those are synchronized off of this clock. Again, this is something I don't need to rebuild live. I have a reset signal, these purple or indigo cables that are also routed to a few different things in the system. Again, they come out to a molt, reset grids, reset Euclidean circles. I have a spare jack here where I'm right now having it reset every four measures. I can use that to trigger something else if I want to. Then the blue cables are some pre-patched modulation. I have three pre-patched modulation outputs from Pamela. A sine wave that's going every 16 bars. It's actually a cosine, so in the downbeat, it's at maximum level and then it goes through its undulation for 16 bars, and then comes back to the top again on the hit. And um, two stepped randoms, one for every beat, one for every measure. Those all come to attenuators on my erogenous tones levitate. That way I just patch in here, and I already have attenuators for all those signals, and I can patch them anywhere I want to in the system without worrying about, does that module have an input attenuator? Similarly, down here on Cara, version of Marbles, I've taken the... Um, 
smooth random output, as well as the three stepped random outputs, the three X outputs. And I brought all those up onto attenuators again on Levitate, just patch anyone I want into, run them throughout the system as I like. So that's pre-patched. Then I just have to worry about where my modulation source is going, where my triggers going, makes it much easier in live performance. Then this yellow mess over here is all the audio pre-routing. For example, I tend to preload Monsoon with things from an ambience module, the disting playing back a bunch of ambience loops. So I've got a patch running from the disting into Monsoon, the Monsoon runs into the stereo mixer. I have outputs from all my main percussion modules already pre-patched into inputs down in my mixer. And then I also have my two effects sense, and we had quite a debate about effects sense last, uh, last episode, where I'm splitting out aux one to go to my reverb send, um, aux two to give me a little bit of reverb, but also go off to my echo send, my echo chain. And the echo chain is a handful of modules that goes through a mix up so I can do ping ponged feedback at the mixer, an overseer, stereo filter, and a formal D. So that's all the stuff that's pre-patched in the system. It's a little bit messy right now. I'm not bothered tying things together until I'm sure I'm happy with this patch and it's working for me. I have a few cables in order from tendrils to go ahead and lower down all these white cables to be right angle cables too. But when I have all this settled after playing with the system for a couple of weeks, I'll tie together everything in very tight bundles to route in between modules to get out of the ways of the knobs get out of the way of the other jacks, then I can just close the lid, travel with it, open it up, plug in my mod audio output, plug in my sync cable off to the black box, bring the black box audio back into the system, and I'm ready to play. It's literally just a matter of trigger to sound source that's already in the mixer. The acoustic system's already patched and ready to go. So that's that's the backbone patch, which is a large part of the system. Yeah. And that knowing that inside out must be what allows you to be creative and to improvise with the system again both in the context of playing on your own and with others i imagine the patch doesn't change that frequently or does it it doesn't between performances yeah. are you swapping things out or is it fairly defined for a good period of time the backbone patch is fairly defined for a good period of time i will go through periods particularly when a new module gets introduced to tweak stuff out for example i recently added and i'll go ahead and focus back down on the bottom part of the mix of the case, because that's what we're going to be playing first. I recently added a bunch of stuff so I could go ahead and play my Folktech Nano Garden. I've added a sequencer, a submixer, random step, etc. So I'm still playing with what's the best arrangement of the backbone patch for that. For example, I found that random step, which I'm normally using to lock in my pitches before they get sent to rings, is actually locking in those voltages faster then my sequencer of Vox Digitalis from Noise Engineering is going to the next step. So random step is locking in the previous note through no fault of its own. It happens to be fast. Mm -hmm. So I've been playing around with what's the right order to put things between the sequencer, the Caltrans to transpose stuff, the random step to lock in my change. That way I can change stuff in between beats and have it take effect the next time I hit my acoustic source and then go to rings. And I've been playing with, with that. But after that, the backbone patch is really, really stable. Um, I can just open up the lid. I don't have to worry about the plumbing yeah. of the audio, etc. I can just focus strictly on what trigger pattern is going to go to what percussion, etc. Focus on those things rather than, oh, yeah, I didn't wire up my effects end. Having the, the sample and hole grabbing the pitch on a new beat or a new gesture from your physical playing of um, Nano Garden or, or the inputs that must offer some kind of safety net in the same way that those that have maybe played um, some kind of live set with something like Ableton Live or any device that will start a clip on the following bar or on the following beat. So you know when you yes. hit a controller or a pad, it's going to be in time. That in-between note adjustment without hearing like a pitch drift must add some kind of level of confidence that I've not really engineered into my own live system <laughs> just yet. <laughs> It's really nice because you can set something up ahead of time and go do another gesture and not worry about getting your timing right on this gesture. So I do set up Ableton Live. I've been Ableton Live user since version one. Um, I'm used to queuing things up ahead of time. As a matter of fact, I have my sequencer, my bitbox, et cetera, all to queue up changes one or two measures 
as their interval. So I can set things up ahead of time and go move around. But if you want, we can play around quickly to just to show you the difference of locking in and unlocking in that pitch. Yeah, just as questions build, just really quickly, a couple of questions. Uh, Brian Garrison yeah. asked, um, um, sorry, not Brian Garrison, it was DB Powlin. How often does a backbone patch change? We obviously just touched on that. But the one yeah. I did want to. Every few months. Yeah, yeah, a, a, a season, as it were. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we also had uh, Oliver Wagner asked, is there a logic behind the color of the tendrils? And I, what I think yes. they would mean is not not the logic of, you know, white is pitch and, and so on and so on. The actual color, maybe? Is there any logic to what is what? Well, there is the basic color of white's pitch, yellow's audio, pink or red's gates, blue's modulation, green's master clock. But what I've started doing in some systems, in some cases, is adding additional colored wire ties onto the cables to help me track particular connections. Hmm. And I just repatched the system, but when, when I get it further together, um, I will start adding more colored wire ties. And let's just go ahead and pan up quickly to my to my modulation section. Um, Where are those wire ties from? Let's go ahead and pull up to here. And you'll have to excuse me for a second because I stumbled over my own cables and kicked out my headphone feed. There we go. Um, you'll notice that all these modulation cables here, if you can see it on the feed, have colored wire ties. So I can trace their source to their destination. So I'm, while I'm relearning a backbone patch, this helps me go, which, which one is this one? Oh, it's that one right there. Um, you know, which is coming out of the smoothly flowing one? Oh, it's the red wire tied blue cable. And I'll even do that on my normal patch cables because when a, a nest starts building of all sorts of triggers going on, I can say, oh, my red trigger cable with a blue wire tie, that's coming out of channel one on grids. That's ending up over on the entity uh, for the kick drum. It's much easier to track a patch rather than physically following a cable throughout a whole patch. Yeah. And we should apologize. We have failed the internet. Francesco Manetti. Uh, Manetti, Manetti. Um I don't know if it was featured in one of your previous streams, but TARDIS stream without the Dalek modulator in the case. <laughs> they say it's good for audio and Tomra modulations. The Dalek modulator, for anyone that doesn't know, is a live wire, um, higher kind of oscillator rate ring mod um, style module. Very good. There was the Vulcan modulator as well that was a much slower kind of... Um, well, they both go sub-audio, but a much slower rate modulator from live wire as well. We failed. Neither of us fought to go buy a Dalek modular, or we did and couldn't find one. <laughs> yeah, they're hard to find. And there's been times I've had a ring modulator in this case. And frankly, I started out with up to three distings in this case with the idea that I could change them to be different things depending on what I wanted to do. And the original reason I did that is because I used to use a vocoder as part of my live system as well. Not for strange talky voice stuff, but to have rhythms of vocode ambient backgrounds to impose rhythms onto other things. Yeah. But I'm just didn't, there's not enough bands in the bow quarter and the distinct. So I kind of just fell off that particular path, but yep. Sorry. No Dalek modulator. Yeah. However, if you've listened to the last episode of, um, patching the TARDIS, Ben's voice had some strange <laughs> choppy stuff going on. So. <laughs> yeah. OBS or YouTube or some kind of streaming gremlin threw in a uh, soundflower. I think it's soundflower. Yeah, it probably was soundflower, which uh, was chaining my audio into the stream. Yeah, one final question yeah. before we hear the thing, as it's uh, again on topic. Uh, DB Powell mentioned yeah. he saw someone somewhere using small stickers on the knobs, um, which they were using to adjust between certain values in a live patch. Um, what do you think about that? How do you remember kind of settings and potential sweet spots, you know, with certain knob turns or moves or gestures? There's two systems that I use. One is just when I'm improvising... Um, I know the system pretty well, although I just introduced a new bunch of new modules. I need to learn those. So I kind of have my head certain ranges that are good. And there's always the pre q bus on the mixer to put something just on the Q bus, find something ahead of time, then bring it up. But the other thing that I do, and I'll admit this is a big cheat, is when I go play more composed pieces, like with Meridian Alpha, I actually have an iPad mini on the stand to my right with patch notes. And I'll just look through that very quickly, who's supposed to be at what settings and go ahead and go through those, including what patch cables to change. Yeah. Um, and thanks to OB1 and Jeff Check for the super chats. Um, Patreon links are in there if you want to support Chris and get access to the learning modular courses and some exclusive content on mine as well. But 
I've got some other questions we'll follow up with. Let's hear it. Let's hear this patch. Yeah, for example, a common thing that I do, and let's go ahead and bring it up here, is I have the Nano Garden fed through ring. So when I hit Nano Garden, you'll actually hear rings play out here. And then the question comes, how do I change pitch? I could ride the frequency control, but that's a bit of a pain. So what I normally do is patch into something such as my little dope for mini keyboard here. So I can choose different notes. And this changes to a mode here where it's less jumpy. I'll show off that little trick later on. But if I change a pitch, it immediately jumps that new pitch while the note's dying out. So that's why I've gone through first capturing that pitch in a sample and hold, and then letting the envelope follower trigger the sample hold to let that voltage get through. And let's make sure I haven't screwed up my patching. Here we go. Through the transpose here. There we go. So I can cue up a new pitch ahead of time. You don't hear it. Whoops. What did I leave off? That's the problem with doing live patching of stuff. Oh yeah, I'm wrong jack, duh. <laughs> Do, 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 do. In. <laughs> this thing's always happen when you're doing live. All right, what are you not plugged into? And we got all your triggers going here. Oh, trigger outs give me trouble. Sorry, this was working just very recently. Hmm. Like half hour ago during Tech Check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I debug this. Go ahead and hit me with another question. So I, because this was working a second ago. There, through there, through there, through there, through there, to there. Okay. So. Oh, duh. No, no. I, I, I realized what I had wrong. I'm not hitting it large and loud enough to trigger the envelope follower, which okay. you'll see with these little red lights on here. There we go. There we go. So now I'm going to pre and another note. I can change pitches without worrying, but the next note will take on that pitch. And I had the envelope file returned up so high that soft taps were not giving me new triggers, only loud taps. Is that something you've ever scaled live? Oh, yes. Um, I play with this all the time because sometimes I want sensitive brushes to come through. And other times I want to make sure I'm doing something very de demonstrative. I've also found a quirk about this particular instrument interface, which um, shows you the loveliness of the unpredictability of hardware. Is when I'm coming into the modular level, it's pretty stable and it's triggering. I have to hit pretty hard. And if I put the sensitivity down, it'll keep a sustained note without crazy re-triggering. However, if I put this to the line level input, it gets a lot more unstable. You hear it re-triggering itself there. Yeah. And that's because the audio level is just fluctuating above and below the threshold of the envelope follower. Does not do that when I have a, the level set to modular. It does do it when I have it set to line. The release time does affect it. It tends to be more stable with a long release time. So I bring it down and start getting that arpeggio. That's the wonders of learning the idiosyncrasies of hardware and how can you use that in performance? Do I want that arpeggio effect or do I just want an individual note? Yeah. Um, just another note on questions. Um, I'm watching the live chat as this goes. Any questions that aren't particularly right on topic there and then just to interject, I'm just copying them into a document. So I will answer them and I'm pretty sure I've got them all so far. Yeah. But one on topic with this, uh, again, D.B. Powell and asked, is this something that could be done with ears as an input stage? Oh, yes, yeah, definitely. And I used ears before I used the Bifaco. Yeah. Um, it didn't do this instability <laughs> that, I, that I found in the Bifaco <laughs> under certain settings. Um, but, yes, you can definitely do that with ears. I definitely had a similar chain of ears going into a sample and hold. Previously, it was a disting before I got the lovely random step. Um, but now this also has phantom power to a microphone, 
So I will also occasionally use acoustic instruments like rattles and have that trigger things as well, like triggering rings. And then the recent thing that I've made, in addition to having the keyboard allowing me to change pitch, is I've added a little sequencer, a Vox Digitalis from Noise Engineering. So I can get my CV from the sequencer instead of from this little mini keyboard. Now I have a little button on the Maleco Performance Molt that says whether or not the bottom jacks follow what's happening with the up higher jacks. When it's off, it's always gonna play the same note. I can manually step through my sequence. Let's change my thresholder. But when I enable that particular control, new triggers from the instrument interface step through my sequence. I'm gonna to go to my more stable modulars level here. I'm using four, vo four voice mode on rings so the notes overlap. Yeah. I've programmed a minor seventh chord into Vox Digitalis spread out as the sequence in terms of going root, minor third, root, minor seventh, fifth, minor third, root, octave down, and back again. I really like the idea of stepping through a preset sequence, but irregularly. Yes. Well, um, Vox Digitalis does have a random mode. Hmm. Where I can go forward or backwards. Or, or palindrome. And then all the system also goes through my clavis caltrans. If I want to go to another octave, let's make sure I'm changing three. Another nice approach I've found for that um, irregularly sequencing through a rhythm is to have separate um, gate rhythms stepping through the sequences. So it might yeah. be just a basic four-step sequencer, but you're using something with probability, different rhythms per bar, ratchets, um, short notes, fast notes, bursts, and um, kind of faster flurries in there. And those four notes don't yeah. need to change, but because they're rhythmically stepping through at different points, what holds and brushes and pushes around the ratchets and things becomes really musical from very little actual step-sequenced information. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, I've got grids now stepping the sequencer instead of a copy from my envelope follower. But since I have it being held by the sample and hold, it's only gonna grab the most recent step. And it's waiting for grids to step before, before it goes on to the next pitch. If I had grids going for something very manic, or something slow, it's only going to change the pitch every so often. I'll just interject to say, Munro, thank you very much. Um, a huge super chat. Um, thank you. We both really appreciate that. Well, thank um, you. That's unexpected and appreciated. We'll find something relevant to do with any super chat money for the pair of us that won't just mean yeah. maybe buying Chris a drink when we can eventually see each other potentially next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll put it to good use. Thank you very much. Um, it'll be cool to capture the shaking of the Nano Garden stand with CV and feed <laughs> that into the reverb and delay depth. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, you can do some. Because I've got um, a little <laughs> microphone adapter here to give it a little shock suspension. Because I actually had trouble with feedback and picking up from the floor too easily. Let me get okay. this back down here. Um, but yeah, it also makes it very dramatic because I can just go ahead and wail on sucker. And it's going to survive. <laughs> and I'm not going to break my hand. It's a great visual, though, or to see you swipe across at something and it, and it still be wobbling on stage. Just the visual yeah. cause and effect of that. But even if you're yeah. not overly dramatic as a performer, I think that it, it makes a big difference for an audience when they're potentially looking at the back of a case at times. Yeah. And let me, you know, this is it going through rings. Um, there's differences in how I set up the Nano Garden through rings, but I also want to give you just the, the raw sound of the Nano. <laughs> you know, it's a stretch, it's a collection of wires and contact mics. 
Now, the trick of the Nano Garden is that it has an alter effects unit built into it. I've got it all set to 100% dry right now, but if I was to set it up to say like their infinite repeat delay, I'm going to join in. Give me a second. <laughs> But what I like, particularly in this, is it has an interesting shimmer reverb. And when I use that to feed grids, you can hear that shimmer go through grids. Which is completely different than the dry. I can even go completely wet on it. Yeah, so that's something I have a lot of fun with. And then I have timed echoes that you'll hear in a little demo piece afterwards. But that gives me a lot of freedom then to play around with a nano garden or a microphone and create these little... And then have rings resonate and create interesting sounds. And, you know, rings has different sounds in it as well. I can have really heavy, rattly drums and, of course, bells. So yeah, fun. It's really nice to hear effects through rings and it to be used as mm -hmm. maybe more as what was intended in its design, but for it to be a resonator for other sounds, which of yeah. course you're doing with the Nano Garden anyway, that's going into rings as opposed to just striking its internal yeah. trigger. But hearing the effects before rings becomes a, a really powerful thing, I think. I agree completely. And, you know, everyone who says rings always sounds the same, I said to them, you know, you obviously are not using the input jack on it. Yeah. Um, it reacts to what you put through it. Yeah. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, and it's, it's interesting how that then excites this idea of the stereo voices, if you've got the, the yeah. odd and the evens panned out in stereo as well. Yes, uh, actually, in that demo down harp, which I think we can probably move to pretty quickly here, mm -hmm. um, that's the case where you can really hear I'm using rings bouncing back and forth, left and right. But I also have a delay and reverb on here as well. So when I do a sound. There's also some left and right ping ponging going on as well. So, Yeah. So another note, just for questions for people that are joining is a little bit later than the start. Um, I'm monitoring the live chat do fire any questions at me if they're not exactly relevant at the moment i'll be putting them into a document and we'll come back to the questions if it's right kind of on point as we're talking about something we'll uh, interject we do have some uh, pre-made much higher quality than streaming quality examples and you mentioned one of them the down harp do you want to yeah. maybe give us a, a quick a... primer on on the down harp patch yeah, down harp, you know, I've been joking with Ben this I'm trying to come up with a new genre down tempo new age um <laughs> is a workout using Nano Garden through rings to show you what it can do, but then also brings in other rhythmic elements, such as triggering some kicks, some random dank cymbals. Yes, I use the word dank again. <laughs> and also external percussion effects. So let's go ahead and play that, and then we can dissect various parts of that too for people who are interested. Yeah, here we go.
What a treat, Chris. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Seriously cool. Um, a lot of people in the live chat, a lot of people throwing their own kind of um, stylistic requests in there for some heavy bass and distortion to make it a bit more like sun, <laughs> which is uh, maybe at odds with uh, the, the general vibe of the patch. But I agree, it's interesting to kind of distort these kind of sounds or mix in really contrasting, thick, distorted sounds and then push them into the backgrounds and things. But... Yeah, I'll maybe let you start with just generally running down the main things going on in that before we come to some of the questions that we had. Yeah, and there's a couple parts of that I want to pull out and highlight because I had some fun with them and they show some of the philosophy of the case. I ran through the acoustic input and what was happening with the Nano Garden and Ring, so you pretty much figured that out. Um, kick drum was the entity, and what I did was is I split the trigger from the grids to go to the entity and also go to another channel on random step. It took its positive output, which is only, you know, it's zero volts half the time, then jumps above it on a little bit of a Gaussian curve for the other half of the time. And I had that going to harmonics on the entity, just so the occasional sounds would get a little more bop to them rather than just being a low kick sound to them. Um, Crucible, off to its strange setting that's not supposed to sound like a cymbal. It's somewhere between a cowbell and that, you know, when you hit it. What's the name of that Latin percussion instrument that's basically a spring on a mount that you hit with a stick? I don't know if it has a formal name to it. Um, um, keep going. I'll find out. Yeah, <laughs> you'll figure it out. <laughs> Someone in the chat will come up with that. Yeah. And then for the snare, I, did, I went old school and went noise into low-pass gate. But I had a lot of fun with the envelope on that because I didn't want it, again, to be just a standard envelope. I used the Zadar for the envelope on that. And unless there's some burning questions, which I don't mind answering, I'd like to go ahead and patch that up and show the difference between just using like a strike input or using something like Zadar to trigger it. Yeah. No great. questions? Good. Yeah, questions. Okay. Just before we yeah. do, let, we'll, we'll chip away at some because they, they are mounting. Um, working sure. backwards, uh, Apollo View, what was the tabla sound? Was it plank? <laughs> they are That's samples, me. right? Yeah, that's me cheating. Um, I have a, a library of loops run, changing, going from funky drums to ethnic percussion to really industrial sounds, um, even like, let's go ahead and even Cold War number stations. Let's see if this one starts up here. Oh, I must have that such a different input right now. I'll pull that up later. Um, oh, it's on a different output, never mind. So I have this companion of loops over on the black box that I will bring in as layers to what I'm doing. And I really like to juxtapose the realistic sounds of a real drummer with the electronic percussion that you might more normally associate with EDM. And that's a, you know, something you'll see me mixing quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, the top sounds for me cheating. It's me getting some really nice loops. Okay. And um, a couple of people asked it, so what we read use names out, but how are you triggering those? Was there any kind of switching and clock doubling going on or were the, the rhythms embedded in the loops as well? Rhythm. Rhythms were embedded in the loops for the tabla line. Okay. Um, that answers Aaron's question about how these roles are being achieved as well. Um, and just because it's been asked a couple of times, I think both times from Jeff Check, uh, can you make a <laughs> fracture explosion sound? <laughs> um, Is well, that to hand? I don't, I don't have it's a not. fracture in here, but the second demo uses Chimera to make an explosion sound. Maybe that's what they meant. Um, we'll, and I will definitely go through that patch later on because that's one of my favorite patches. Yeah, we'll hold off. Um, Constantine did, did ask with the black box, how are you clocking it? What's the? I'm clocking it using a 16th note clock that goes off to the um, split from Pamela's expander. That is the um, times four clock. The way the black box works is one 16th notes. It does not have a reset, but if it does not see a clock for a second or two, then it will go back to the head. So if I stop Pamela, make sure black box is in play mode, otherwise it won't listen to external clocks, then restart Pamela, my count will return back to bar number one up here at the top. Okay. And that's been a good, reliable way of resetting, starting in time. Is it, is it learning yeah. clock at all, or is it like a slight pickup when you start Pamela again? Uh, no, it will, it will follow. Um, it will follow the clock. Um, I have – it's not really – possible to cue something that starts when Pamela starts. Because mm -hmm. if I press a loop, 
it will keep freewheeling off the previous tempo it received from the clock. And that is definitely a feature request I have into Aaron, is that I prefer to pre-cue something, hit Pamela, and have my samples come in on the downbeat. That's yeah. not the case. So I will start this up ahead of time and then get Pamela running and then pre-cue something. And I have all my quantization set in here to only start loops and one-shots on measures. Okay. I think for particular questions for now that they're the main ones um any more questions on this keep them coming um again i'm still watching the live chat yeah so i'm going to patch up just a little bit of that white noise strike snare we had going in i'm using the 6 db channel on make noise um it has a longer release to it a fatter sound as opposed to the 12 db channel which is a very sharp sound and very quick and delay and if i was just to throw well, here I have my keyboard already ready to go here. A regular trigger into its strike input. There's two things that are interesting about it. Let me go ahead and bring it up here. Is it B? Yeah, there it is. It does have some leakage. You can't hear it through Skype because Skype has a noise gate on it. But even when I bring it up, there's the hiss of the noise going through this, which is one of the downsides of the LXD. But mm -hmm. also, when I start feeding it a CV, you'll hear that it takes several hits until the Vactral builds up energy and opens up. And actually, that can be a cool way to start out a piece. What I did in that previous piece was, is I patched the CV with a fader up and let the beats naturally build as the Vactral got excited. So it's going to get that going. Probably can't hear it too well with Skype's noise gate, but it starts mm. from silence and being very muted to building up its own. There was a slight, a slight yeah. lifting of the sound. That's the strike input, which is a normal thing. Um, nice decay, kind of short. I have color on the noise rainbow. Do I make it very damped? Or very bright? And it also has a digital noise, which can really be um, quite harsh. Kind of fun, actually. A lot of bass to that. Clock it way down to high. I really like those lower clock rate kind of downsampled yeah. noise tones because they impart this, as you say, like a low fundamental pitch with this odd. Yeah. Through a low pass gate, it kind of loses that retro game edge, but it still has this <laughs> kind of fuzz to it. It's um, it's an interesting yeah. sound. Yeah, Fourth of July. we just celebrated 4th of July here last weekend, so it's kind of like fireworks <laughs> in the distance. But that's the type of sound you'd get with a normal analog A to D decay envelope. And I wanted something that was more interesting, so I employed Zadar to trigger it instead. So I went ahead and pulled up some a couple of different envelopes. I'll play around with them in Zadar. Something that has a lot more ripples in them. I'll go ahead and take my... Output from that. You're going to have a really inter interesting intersection of those lower clock rate noise tones that seem to kind of like kind of flitter out or flutter out as the the sound decays, with yeah. a now fluttering, fluttering kind yeah. of modulation source as well. CV input. Yeah, you can hear that. Yeah. So it's a very warped. Envelope, and I'll go ahead and switch cameras so you can see that air closer and see what's going on with the envelope choice there. More pronounced at high pitches. Or the analog noise. And if you can see Zadar, you can see the envelope that's running through here. For those who are curious, that's which one? That's shape G0. But I have another preset loaded with a different shape that I actually use for the song. So I'm just going to switch over to that. Whoops. Press load, not save. Yes. And I can play with a bias to make the after echoes low and level. Or very prominent.
So yeah, that's one of the tricks in that particular piece was using noise, but with a more complex envelope to trigger it. So in terms of the kind of artistry of this and performing with it, this is very micro-focused. It's not just a noise strike through a low-pass gate. It's really considering the ripple of the decay, the tone of the noise. How are you kind of managing this live? Because it's somewhat minimal. They're not these huge, bombastic, frantic beats. Is that the kind of evolving nature of how you like to perform? Is, is zoning into these micro sections of what's going on and slowly evolve everything kind of in turn? Because you can only manage so much of that at once. So imagine if you're focusing on this, the shaping of this for at least a few measures of the music is what you're focused on, right? Yeah, and that's why I prefer the slow build is I like to add a new element, have you enjoy that, add a new element, have you enjoy that, add a new element, have you enjoy that? And that's why when I play by myself, well, it depends on who I'm playing with. Um, sometimes when I'm playing with other people, they're filling all the space and you cannot hear those details. Yeah. So I'll just go for, for frantic beats and much more percussive stuff and none of the subtle enveloping stuff, things like that. But if I'm composing my own pieces or I got a chance to play with Abe Mora, Earth 626 at the SoCal Synth Festival. Well, it was, it was Synth Meetup in January. He opens up a lot of space in his work. So it was really nice to jam with him because I had room to develop sounds like that. And then he would basically answer the sounds as opposed to me just trying to be the drummer being heard above the guitarist. We need to have a jam. My life case is very washy ambient. We could definitely be creating space for each other to... Uh... That, I think Let's that would not be cool. do that over a live stream if people feel like suggesting that one. <laughs> the idea of streaming quality to try and do it live um yeah we'll think about that though for whenever the world opens up again as it were yeah i will be back in europe eventually yeah. and likewise back in the states hopefully but so that's just one of those sounds that's one of the elements the other thing is i did have the um, crucible in what i call dank mode and um <laughs> apparently dank was the word of the uh stream last yeah. time people, uh, like people had a lot of fun with that <laughs> um but i'll just patch together quickly how i use two different trigger sources to trigger the edge and the mid inputs on Crucible just to come up with some different sounds. I'm going to unwind some cables here just to make life a little easier. I'll start with going to just a um, pattern from grids that's supposed to be basically hi-hat based. Go to mid on Crucible, bring that up. That's supposed to be their normal cymbal sound, but if you go to the far right, you get these sounds. And um, I'll play around with making that just a short sound. Tone down is a real pingy sound. And I usually feed that through a time delay. So you get these interplays of the echo against the original pattern. But then I'll pull a second trigger source from something like Euclidean circles. And I'll run that through my probability skipper to decide how dense those beats are. So I'll pull the echo out for now. Right now we're hearing just grids. Euclidean to probability skipper to the edge input on Crucible. I have probability set to zero, so you don't hear any edge hits. As I bring it up, it'll start interjecting edge hits based on the pattern I've set up on Euclidean circles. And when the two hit together, it's a mid sound. It doesn't, I don't mean to diminish the work involved in, in what's led to this, but it doesn't take much for a sound to be that much more animated. Oh yeah. I mean, if I just left the grids, I just have that or, you know, I don't have too much going yeah. on, but, and if I was using Euclidean circles flat out, I'd get this, but it's the same pattern. But the fact that I can pull back probability, play with the density of Euclidean circles, thin its way out. It doesn't take a lot. You know, you know I'm not saying I'm a rocket scientist here. I stumbled across <laughs> some tricks. <laughs> you know, that 
to me makes it more human, more interesting to listen to. Rather than it's the same thing, the brain's figured it out, move on. I want someone who is used to listening to maybe jazz or something like that go, oh, it's like a drummer interjecting little changes from measure to measure yeah. rather than being always the same. And it's those subtle changes for me, but certainly as a drummer, when you, I first found drum machines and I was younger and it was an open or a closed hi-hat. I was like, well, mm-hmm. even in notation, there's a half open hi hat symbol. But then, <laughs> physically, while playing a hi hat, you it's entirely variable from symbols touching to them sloshing around to really kind of hitting each other to being so wide open. The top symbol rings like a crash or a splash. Yeah, and I was like, where's all that? Where? Why are dynamics just an accent on and off? And why are some drum machines just a global accent? So when I program an accent, every single drum is played louder. When I'd spent years learning to be able to hit the bass drum harder without cranking the hi-hat really hard at the same time. <clears throat> so modular really opened yeah. all that up for me. And, oh, I can use VCAs for dynamics, and then it's entirely variable. And then like the new WMD yeah. modules, there's some idea of, it's not just a symbol, but it has an edge that it's electronic of course but somewhat mirrors this idea of tonal shifts and accents and different patterns over time it makes a huge difference oh yeah and um then there's cv and everything too yeah so that's why i really like something like this is going to sound like a, a ben testimonial this is why i really like something a like random step because i've split like the pattern off of grids i'll put into a trigger input on that it's going to bring it back up again here this must all really help that blend with something like that tabla loop as well. Oh, yeah. I, I'll keep things purposely sparse so I can go ahead and mix stuff in. Let's go ahead and bring up the tabla loop since you've brought it up. Um, I have different banks set up. It's like top loops, tablas and udus, kunkas and, and not hams, just so I know the different flavors of what I'm bringing up here. Let's go ahead and bring up... I'm taking now the positive output from random step and going to the decay so my hats will occasionally open up. So regardless of the, the space it's adding, just back to what I was saying a second ago about them yeah. fitting well together, Forgetting about tonally trying to sound like an acoustic instrument, it seems to fit yes. because it's dynamic, because there's something to it. It feels that bit more human in a way. Yeah. And I'll just bring up my random second steps. It's not like two percussionists. Yeah. One's reacting to the other one rather than just two patterns playing. Nice question from OB1 related to what we're talking about. Is the aim always for more humanization or do you like to push beyond that? And they followed up to say one of the joys of modular for them is being able to push drums beyond the realms of what's normally possible. Yeah. um, When I say I'm trying to go for humanization, it's not like I am trying to sound like a drummer Mm. um, because I purposely have picked sounds that are not your standard drum sounds. Yeah. Like instead of playing a nice clean cymbal on this uh, crucible, I'm purposely going for you know, something like that instead. But I look at how would a, an acoustic instrument work? How would the musician playing that acoustic instrument induce variations? And I try to take ideas from that to apply to modular. So how can I take the expressiveness a real musician can have with an acoustic instrument and apply it in the electronic realm to get that variation, not to replicate the real drummer on a real instrument, but just to take elements of that performance and map it onto a new soundscape. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe animation is a better adjective than humanization. Yeah. 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 It kind of makes sense. Um, Cool. Yeah, uh, Ali the Architect is working on a module uh, module specifically geared towards slop and the humanization of drums, um, meaning the <laughs> timing, which the idea of like boom bap, boom bap and slop, uh, drunken beats, wonky beats, 
goes well beyond the realms of swing and just an odd gate delay. Um, it's a whole other... You could spend your life studying kind of hip-hop. Jay Dilla beats, for a start, is kind of the the kind of top reference point to go to. But, um, yeah, you're not looking for humanization of timing with this particular setup, are you? It's still very much on the grid. Yeah, it's very much on the grid. I don't do a lot with jitter. For example, I tend to leave jitter turned all the way down, for example, on... Um, on marbles because i am very groove oriented you know i'm i used to be a bass player i'm very much you know where is the freaking one <laughs> so <laughs> i James Brown. try to give make him... sure you hit the one <laughs> <laughs> so i try to give that to hold on to and again you know i think it gives an a listener who's not as adventurous as many modular people are something to hang on to rather than it seeming to be randomness or seeming to be noise but then within that grid i'm trying to introduce variation to make it more interesting this is not against people who do this really crazy, you know, there's a question about burst generators. I don't happen to have one in here. It's not speaking against that because that's a really fun genre to go with this completely manic Richard Devine type of approach. I'm really, in general, I love hip hop for how it's broken down all these rules of how music's supposed to be made and what timbres you're supposed to use, et cetera. So I think it's really great. Someone like Ali is working on a module mm -hmm. for timing because a lot of us stupid, you know, frankly, white engineers who try to put human feel into drum machines in the early days, put in just a random value, and it sounded like a sloppy drummer. Yeah. It did not sound like feel. Yeah. So I'm happy that someone who has a real empathy for the genre is designing that rather than just an engineer. Yeah, absolutely. Omri and a couple of others in the chat mentioned Colin Benders was sequencing his clock to do this kind of sloppy clock thing. Really different to hip hop and boom bap it was cool i remember the stream where colin did that this kind of sequencing the whole clock that ran the whole system so you just get this odd shifting um listen to drop by far side i'll maybe drop some links in um if i get a moment like certainly if anyone's curious you can hit me up afterwards for some really nicely produced beats tea leaf oh, excuse me tea leaf dancers by flying lotus is another one there's loads, but there's another tangent, maybe a bit unrelated to this case. Yeah, we'll have to make up a, a, a playlist reference after. <laughs> yeah, and I'll certainly, I'll get Ali on in the future. Um, we're due a kind of catch-up call soon anyway, so I'll bring it up and see if he wants to come on and talk about it. Corey, B-Boy, Ken Flux, there's a good few people kind of really in that world, grounded in that, that kind of sound. So, yeah, I'll have to do yeah. something with them soon. Cool, so what other sounds? going on there i th pretty much the only other thing that happened there was just my you know famous or favorite or whatever you want to call it um ssf entity kick let me go ahead and just start running another patch for that you notice i'm using these uh doppio splitters quite a bit i love these to be able to run triggers to multiple places this has become one of my favorite chords um they're not they're not manufacturing any more right now yeah. i don't know if there's gonna be more in the future but these are worth grabbing mm -hmm. so but i'll just run one off to the trigger for the kick for now it's also bring up the SSF. also luigi's modular that do the uh the two different heights of right angled cables that question came yes. up earlier the power cables my brother actually through a starving student on um reverb and ebay is selling a lot of the leftover stock of the luigi's cables right now so entity is a kick i like to use quite a bit um one thing I particularly like about it is that it has a body to go from real muted sounds to more of a nice strike tone, which they call loose. This probably sounds like crap over Skype, but hey. Um, and harmonics from being just a really muted strike. And I'll add some more decay. To what I particularly like, it's a bit of a wave folding effect. You can quite, quite extreme. So I can sequence a pattern to play with harmonics. I'll play with that quite a bit live. But then again, I'll use something like random step. Trigger in. I'm going to take the bipolar CV out. And I probably should run this through an attenuator because it's going to be full range. But we'll just go nuts here right now and go to harmonics. Again, so that not every strike's the same. 
I'll also quite often run a separate pattern from marbles to change that so it's maybe only every few beats or every measure. So let's go ahead and go down to something running a little slower here. Oh, we hear the clock noise get through. That's interesting. Hmm. I find a way to use that. Something a little more richer in pattern there. So I use Entity quite a bit because I also like another feature of it is that it has noise in it as well because it's supposed to be a percussion module. I like the clock tick. I, uh, yeah, that's a nice little carry. I have to use that. See, and this is a fault, a fault, <laughs> mind you, of analog um, that I'm going to exploit in the future. Uh, but I'll quite often then play around with something like that random signal going to the noise decay. And again, this is full level. I usually tend to be much more subtle than this. And when the voltage changes, it's choking off the noise. Again, it's fairly simple and relatively subtle thing but again this animation makes a huge yeah. huge difference to just static beats because if that wasn't in there yeah it was just like it's just like it might as well be a sample mm. as opposed to let's get some echo going here it starts to sound like two layers very easily There we go. That's the medical happening. Excuse me while I get lost. <laughs> we need a kind of surachai level of compression and distress saturation on that. <laughs> <laughs> Wake everybody up. I can't quite get it quickly on muscle, but we can play that later. Um, yeah, but then I also will use these echoes as their own instrument. I'll go pre-fade or pull SSF out, so you're just hearing the echoes. That was a big thing for me in my live case, to be able to go fully wet. Yeah. And also transition. So there's a little bit of reverb happening, and yeah. Yeah, just hear the reverb on my side. Hopefully that's coming across the stream. So I'll take quite often something like a smooth random, such as for marbles, and go ahead and put that into the master cutoff. Ooh, there was a little rising resonance there that very yeah. much kind of uh, lent itself to the tabla loop we heard before. I kind of yeah. A little higher. I like that to be a counterpoint to the original sound. Do you find when you're kind of filtering and all those swooshy resonant sounds, being on the effects, you can be that bit more heavy handed with them than you would on the dry sound? Yeah. Yeah, because I can go for like super resonant here. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same same idea as parallel compression, isn't it? Or parallel saturation or anything that you can do something heavier handed and blend a bit of it in as opposed to overall having to be more subtle on the, yeah. on the dry side of the chain. That's fun. I'll do that quite often with little things like hi-hats, stuff like that too, just get those strange little filtered hi-hats going on, but as the echo, not as the primary sound. Yeah. 
I was doing it earlier. Uh, I've been filming for the CV thing by Bifaco, so I was making mm-hmm. some beats. Had an external drum machine controlled by the modular back into the modular, but the effects chain was the crush delay, which is the noisy PT uh, delay chip. And because that had all this kind of crisp and crunch of the delay chip on, I was then really quite resonantly filtering that around in a stereo space. And it was way more heavy handed on its own than I would ever do on a, a, a dry drum beat or on a single kind of signal chain of a drum beat. Yeah. It certainly blends underneath really well. Yeah, that's just, just the echo there. They bring in the main crisp one. Go for runaway feedback. Hit the reverse button. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, What I'll do is I'll also patch something else that's putting out a trigger or a CV. I'll just take one of my CVs here into one of the reverse so just some of the sounds will get a there you go that's, that, that's the reverse light let's get the dry up god I love the DLD <laughs> yeah So another one of my tricks. Yeah, I'll, I'll patch that quite often where I'll have one CV making one of the sides randomly reverse or not reverse. And re- you can't hear this because my Skype feed is only in mono, but then that's ping-ponging left and right channels too. So suddenly one channel will get reversed and then it'll flip over to the other side because I have the feedback loop flipped at the mix-up. Yeah, seriously cool. I've just put a link um, to the DLD from 4MS um, if people want to pull that out for later. Really seriously cool. Um Oh, I've had you on the wrong thing for ages. You should have told me I had the wrong camera angle up. Sorry. I, I was, yeah, I was just kind of drifting <laughs> away with the, with the DLD yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, sorry. You didn't get to see me having fun patching stuff and doing swooping. That was my mistake. Sorry. No, it's okay. Sorry, we were working up here. No, I was kind of focused on <laughs> just underneath my shot on screen of what you were fading up on the mixer and just listening to the DLD. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. So... We are a good kind of hour and 20 in. Um, we we oh, do have okay. another uh, pre-made, kind of higher quality demo that uh, Chris has already prepared. Um, yeah. I would imagine Chris will share that with his Patreon supporters and they'll have access to all of this after the stream in even better quality because it won't be streaming. But the pre-made file is certainly of a higher standard than a, an actual stream. So is there anything else with this patch you'd like to focus on, Chris, before we move on to no, the next example? That's the main parts. You know, obviously the star of the show is the Nano Garden. That's a lot of fun to play with. But also just the little tricks like having two different trigger sources going to Crucible, just get a little more action going on there. And going old school with a noise through a low-pass gate for percussion, but a more interesting envelope from Zadar to give it a zipper to it rather than just a normal decay. You know, those are, those are the main tricks in that particular piece. Yeah. We'll just give everyone a moment um, for any specific questions about this patch yeah, yeah. And, and the bit that we heard either pre-recorded or... Uh, the live patching examples as well. Yeah, I'm sorry I had the monitor behind me. You didn't get to see me doing the patching, but it's pretty obvious from the red cables. Those are the triggers flying around and being being split off to go down to random step as well. And so, what was the reverb when you said let's add a bit of reverb? Oh, uh, that's effects aid. Okay. Um, when I'm doing solo work, I'll also really spend a lot of time choosing which reverb to use on effects aid and setting the parameters and even swooping the parameters like changing, you know, retuning the shimmer pitch or something like that during a song. Yeah. When I'm playing with someone else, those little subtle tricks are less obvious. So I'll go to something like on effects aid right there was their phase shifter going into a reverb just so it has a little bit more interesting swooping going on with the ambience rather than just being a straight reverb. Yeah. I think we're good for questions on this. Um, if anything comes to mind, again, ask away in the live. Lost you, Ben. 
Oh, there we go. Take a drink. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was just saying that I think we've uh, I think we've got all questions from people in the chat. There's no new questions coming in specifically about this case. If anyone wants okay. to ask questions about uh, this, do let us know. Um, uh, we can ask again towards the end. But for now, let's yeah. um, let's move on to the next patch. What's um, a little bit of a primer on the next one? Yeah, the next one now focuses on the bottom part of the case a lot more than the top part of the case. Sequencing and um, a couple of oscillators, playing around with filters and things like that. And I wanted to basically show how I built up something using a couple different channels of the vector sequencer along with a couple of oscillators and mixers. And in this next song we're going to hear, I'm using one pitch out from vector to actually play the notes to the sequencers, to the, excuse me, to the VCOs playing around with the octave transposition a little bit on the clavis caltrans to go ahead and change the relationship between the oscillators and mixing them in and out. And there's um, a bit of an envelope trick I'll show you with some of that too. But then I'm using the second sequence line in vector, going into my um, Leipzig WK1 A room edition buffered molt to transpose everything. And what I actually did in that case is I split the pitch voltage. Yes, I know. I always say don't split the pitch, but I did. <laughs> um, used one of it to transpose the oscillators, but then also copy that off to transpose the kick drum and the plonk. So I could use a buffered mult copy of my transposition voltage to retune the percussion elements while the whole sequence was transposing as well. So you hear the really airy, noisy stuff from plonk in particular. The kick didn't come through on this particular take. I, this was just a one take thing. Um, when I have its harmonics cranked up, you can hear it as well. And then just a couple other little simple things like layering in drums, um, presetting particularly things like crash cymbals on the bitbox to happen only on downbeats. So I can say, okay, I know a transition's coming up. Let's queue up a big crash, then go change parameters like an octave switch on the oscillators. So while the black box is saying, here's a crash, I can also hit a new octave on the oscillator and do those things simultaneously rather than having to hit that at exactly the same time I'm turning this knob over here and getting confused. Um, so that's the main tricks. Yeah, let's go ahead and play that. So it's, it's a little bit, you know, I grew up listening to Klaus Schulz and Tangerine Dream, so that's the obvious influence for this piece. Yeah. Um, any, well, we're not promising we'll give you them, but any recommended, I'd like to hear this with dot 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 comments are absolutely welcome i'm not sure we'll, we'll be sun owing anything uh sun doom metaling any sounds in this one but let's take a listen Thank you. 
really nice to hear some symbols getting some love in there. <laughs> I spend so much time when I'm producing music, granted not that often in modular, um, where I will, for example, just, you know, fading up noises and then crashing into big re reverbs, just... <sighs> <laughs> um, you know, but also I used to play in a band called um, Black Diamond Beer, which is also the name of a Bob Dylan song. And the keyboard player, uh, I'd be playing electronic drum kit and uh, keyboard, guitars, singer, electronic pop-ish kind of thing. Just He would just have white noise going through a channel with a controller map to filter cut off. And just mm. because it's such a common thing in electronic music, which is kind of the, the what the cymbals are doing here and what a drummer would do with real cymbals, just to be able to throw in that whoosh, for some transitional effects into some delays and things, it makes a big difference. The whole feel of that for me centred around me knowing that a cymbal sound was going to come round. It was like almost everything else in my mind was in between the cymbals <laughs> for, some, <laughs> for some reason. I do love the accents, though, of hitting a cymbal crash. And, you know, it can be synthesized, too. I could just bring up an individual trigger out of something. But I, taking advantage of the tools I have here, just use a sampled one as well so I can go change something else on the modular. But I agree. I love the punctuation, hitting a transition, telling people to change places. Um, some drummers like Billy Cobham were particularly amazing on cymbals. There was a Mahavishnu song where it was just building to a climax, building to a climax, you could just tell what was going to happen was a huge crash, and he just went ding on the bell instead. It completely changed the energy to the next section. So those little accents can really mark out sections and transitions, and I think that's an important thing. It's not doesn't just have to be a rave up, you know. Doesn't have to be, hey, 16, 30 seconds. It can be other things to go ahead and, and play with the energy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, isn't Black Diamond a cider? It may be. It may very well be one of those uh, comes in a three litre plastic bottle that people drink in parks around rundown northern towns in Britain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Black Diamond Bay was the band. They work really well, the symbols. They really do make a big difference. And it's amazing how well everything's blending. The drums, obviously, real acoustic drum loop. The symbols, yeah. are they just one shots that you're firing off? Just one shots. I have them set up as a one shot in addition to my loops. So the loops will transition on downbeats like you can do with live. But also, I used to do this with live as well, set up one shots and just say, okay, next measure, I won't really want to accent that. Yeah. And it's easier than trying to patch live, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. The, the push and pulling in the loop was interesting as well. There was a certain, not getting out of time, but a certain kind of, ooh, it's pushing. And then as the loop came back around from the acoustic loop, it coming in. Yeah. Was that just the loop you selected? You like the feel of the player in that loop? Or are you yeah, the, manipulating that's, uh, that's, that somehow? Oh, yeah. Then, no, that's, that's Brain. He's an amazing drummer. And he has a sample library called um, One Stroke Done. And um, he has fantastic feel and more variations than you hear out of a lot of other drum loops. And I really liked how he can do these interesting feels and these little... Just little details. So a lot of those are like 32 bar loops rather than being, you know, two bars, etc. Just so they have that variation over time. Mm. There are some, I couldn't name many by name, but there are some very mediocre sample packs, but it's also some very, very good <laughs> sample packs as well. Yeah. It's just uh, uh, finding Keith right LeBlanc's thing. another one of my favorite drummers. His hi hat work in particular is really good. Mm. Mm. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. We'll be. <laughs> <laughs> we can certainly talk about uh, drummers for a couple of hours. Let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> but with that kind of loop where there's, it wasn't so much of your modular percussion over that one. Is that because you want the feel of that loop to shine, or is it in any way because it's hard to make the grid that the modular is running on to to push and pull and ebb and flow in the same way? That's actually a kind of a stripped down version of a piece I recorded for Data Colladio, where I did use more modular percussion as well, including a lot more metallics um, on beats and things like that. I actually edited this piece earlier today. There was a hi-hat pattern later on, but I didn't think it added much after the first demo. I'll bring on other layers on top of that. Additional kick drums, too, to go ahead and pump and underneath and just give like a double kick feel underneath a normal drummer's setup. Um, so I will layer that but I mainly was focusing on the sequence on that, and I just wanted to add some excitement to it. 
Um, for me, Berlin School of Music really went downhill when they got drum machines mm. and was better with live drummers playing with it. Um, there was a whole era there where they, they, we've got drum machines now. Like, oh, my God, just no, please stop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the feel of an interesting drummer, you know. And I think it's a nice juxtaposition to have like this bop, 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 bop sequence going. Well, I saw something. I looked at the chat briefly. Yes, I am using what's called chance operations on the vector sequencer to say ratchet the notes, but with a low probability. Um, so just occasionally notes will get doubled up, just add a little bit of variation of feel. But otherwise, take a very mechanical sequence and then add the feel of drummer. I like that juxtaposition. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really nice, it's a really enjoyable thing to play to, a, a preset modular sequence or any synth sequence, any kind of reg regimented um, strict timing sequence, and then to be loose with it and to push and pull around it. It's a nice kind of anchor because when you're playing with other people, you tend to collectively shift somewhere. It's hard for, say, a, a bass player to really kind of pin it down and the drummer start to push and pull and the bass player not want to push and pull into that groove and feel with them. Or yes. vice versa, not, you know, for, for a drummer to pin that and not want to push because the guitarist and the keys player is pushing and things like that. So it's nice when it's a machine and you just know it's not going anywhere. Yeah, as a bassist, I um, played with just a fantastic drummer when I was in high school. Um, he and I were very good at rhythmically locked in. Like a pick, I used to play plectrum bass. Mm -hmm. So a pick stroke would match his drums. But when I would go off time on purpose for feel, he would just give me these dirty looks. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're off to the groove. Get back. <laughs> yeah. Um, where can we find that sample pack? There's a couple of comments in the chat. Is it Brian from Primus? And... Uh, Someone may have found it. They said thanks for the tip, but I'll put a link yeah, in. What yeah, was brain for again? Brain, not Brian, but brain. Although I think his full name is like Brian something. Um, Brian, forget sorry. it now. Yeah, one stroke done. One Twenty-four stroke bit. Done. Excellent library. Many many different songs. He's done them all as songs. So you have like several different verse patterns, several different chorus patterns, second verse, second chorus. Um, that's the type of sample library I hunt out because I want variations. I have over on this. Bitbox, several different of his verses and choruses, just so I can go between different variations of his drums. That's some side stick, obviously. Or ride cymbal. I have this on two measures. Some of the verse stuff. I could listen to him all day. Anyway. <laughs> Just laughing at a comment in the chat when we went down the route of a uh, cheap cider bean drinking parks. Kest <laughs> Kestrel Super Strength, which was a very strong lager that God knows why you'd find yourself drinking that, um, unfortunately. Someone said, how did it manage to smell like baked beans? <laughs> <laughs> and that's just caught my eye from Apollo in the chat. If anyone knows why Super Strength Lager smells like baked beans, um, drop some knowledge in the chat. <laughs> I'm um, sure, sure sugar is a common element in there somewhere. Yeah, it's got to be. <laughs> so with those chance operations, were they in the ratcheting and probability-based rhythmic work in the synth line? Yeah, in, in, in the synth line. Let's go ahead and bring up um, the synth line, if I got up here. Let's bring up one of the oscillators. Let's start with it. Let me change the presets to some more interesting envelopes. I think I had it on this set. Oops. There we go. So there's two notes, but just random ratcheting thrown on some stuff. And again, changes cube root measures. And the second oscillator. Yeah. 
Yeah, just those random ratchets. I, I, I like the feel of that. Yeah. It adds a huge amount. Um, I mentioned earlier filming with an external drum machine for the CV thing video, which comes out on Friday. And it, it was just an 808 style external drum machine, but it was infinitely more interesting with varied track lengths per part. So it's polymetric with probability with some ratchets and probability over ratchets. The whole thing just came alive in a, in a way that you just wouldn't get out of an XOX style drum machine on its own. Not that mm -hmm. this is that sound either, but just to reinforce the idea that any of this accents, probability, rhythmic shifts, merging and mixing rhythms and controlling them live it does make a huge difference. Yeah, I think it keeps interest in the piece. I mean, on the other hand, there's other times I would like listen to Loop Guru or something like that and just want that trance, repetitive, drift off, very slow evolution. I listen to a lot of Steve Roach, um, but I guess I have an attention deficit disorder and I just need to have these little changes to keep me interested. <laughs> um, X I X O A R in the chat. Um, if you can pronounce that in a certain way, try and phonetically type that out. I'm curious. But uh, they ask, do you tend to play these presets live or do you just sequence through them and then play with the sounds? I think they mean the patterns when they say presets. Yeah, I'll I'll typically arrange like at least four different, in vector speak, a preset is a different pattern. So on the one sequence track, I can have different presets, which are different patterns I can pull up. And I'll quite often build evolutions from very simple, like one note, two note, four note, and then the full 16 note sequence. Um, but then I'll also we'll play around with muting and unmuting steps of those live as well. Uh, that's another favorite trick of mine. So there's a combination of building patterns ahead of time, changing live which patterns I want to go in between, and muting and unmuting steps. How often do you, find, do you ever find playing with others that keys change? Are you having to shift... Uh, scale modes or quantizing within this system much is there ever a you know i've been on stage ready to play a song and there's maybe a dep singer um a different singer to the normal one for a some kind of function performance just playing covers mm -hmm. and uh you're literally you're just going in to count off four beats to play in and the md of the band maybe the keys player shouts over to the rest of the band i oh, remember that Rachel, that's the depth, can't play, you know, her voice is a bit lower, so we're going to play it in B-flat, and you're literally two beats into the counting. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, don't quite have that with this situation. I'm not, I've not had that, and I do ask, I, when I play with guys back in L.A. that I play with for ages, Richard Bug, a flautist, and Lucky Westfall, a bass player, I do ask, you know, hey, before I start building sequences for us to play over, What's your preferred keys? Because there's some things that are a lot easier or harder to play, particularly on the flute. Mm. Um, but this is another thing where I can go ahead and cheat a little bit with Caltrans. Since I can put something on a Q bus, I can go ahead and say, oh, no, wrong. Whoops, let's get the right. I'll say, oh, there we go. Okay, that's the key. Then I can bring up the fader. <laughs> yeah. Because it has quantized semitones in addition to octaves. So that'll happen quite a bit too when I'm playing like, oh, where's the guitarist now? Um, and I'll put something on the cue bus, play with the tuning. Fortunately, Caltrans is quantized. I don't have to go off grid with the frequency controls in the oscillator. Find it, then bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because you're transposing after the vector sequencer. Yeah. Vector sequencer goes into Caltrans. It's normaled between two channels. That's these two white cables here coming into two inputs of the uh, Leipzig work. Those two outputs go to the braids and to the twin waves. But in between, there's also a jack here where I can transpose it either using my little, that's another trick to actually for your problem you just brought up. I can go ahead and patch in the voltage from my little dope for mini keyboard into that transpose jack and shift the whole thing by semitones. Or I'll also program a second sequence in the vector, bring it into that jack as well. So you could be working in a particular key that you're thinking as a set of intervals and a tonal center. Like you mentioned earlier, having yeah. a C minor seven set of intervals. Yeah. It might be that you don't yeah. change those notes, but you just offset them by a tone. So you're now in D instead of C, for example. Let's do this. Oops, this one. So I could play transpositions from the keyboard and have all the oscillators go. And that's 
one of those things I've pre-patched on this to have those jacks there <laughs> so I can just, you know, do it literally that fast rather than, oh, uh, and then have to repatch the pitch to all the oscillators, which means pulling out the cables, going into a um, precision multiple, you know, precision adder. Yeah, that's why so much of this is pre-patched and laid out like this. Um, an interesting uh, point from Apollo just asking about, is going back to what we said earlier and slightly off for this patch, but um, is there a go-to for changing the timing of patterns other than just a gate delay? Not really at present that I know of. Some sequences, like say the variegate, will have a delay per step, but they are adding time, delaying in terms of pulling forward. And as a player, it might be that you need to snap onto beat two and four that bit quicker, kind of push into it a little bit faster. So to do that on modular, you'd have to go back a step on the sequencer and delay almost to the next step. So it's a very um, or backwards kind of way of thinking because you can't pull back in time unless you do have micro timing, which is not that common. Does the vector have it? Is that what you're going to tell me? Yes. There we go. Yeah, the vector can, can do some really cool stuff. Like I that. didn't know it did that. And everything, and everything's pre-queued, so it can go both directions. And he's continually adding features to it. This um, Jim Coker, the guy who wrote this, is the guy who wrote the numerology software sequencer, and then decided to try to make it into hardware. So he's going to keep adding features because numerology is quite a mature piece of software. But oh, uh, with a proper sequencer, I might need you a can too. indeed. You do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it's just so lovely. And you got these buttons here for each step and the knob for each step. And look at all that. And anyway, uh, you know, there's my pitch. There's my gate durations for each step. There's my velocity for each step. There's my chance rotations for each step. My ratcheting for each step. I mean, anyway, sorry. I like it. Um, no, my interjection. Well, getting, back to, <laughs> getting back to what I was saying, though, with a microprocessor-based system, it should be possible to program individual steps to be ahead rather than always a delay behind. That's something someone programming a rhythm pattern generator could do, where they have a finer clock happening inside the machine and give you an offset as to which clock number the next step gets triggered on. That's completely doable. LFOs, I really want LFOs to have swing. So instead of wah, 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 mm -hmm. this is doable. Um, we just need to do it. And that's why I got excited earlier when you say someone like, you know, Holly the Architect, and um, the Afrorack people collaborated on the OR switch, and I'm really happy here that Ollie's doing more rhythmic-based stuff because you need musicians who have produced this stuff and say, what are the limitations of this? Let's program around the limitations rather than just living with what the machine gives you. Yeah, yeah. You can do swung LFOs in peaks from mutable instruments. Oh, cool. The, Good, the I, did, tap, did I know that. Yeah, the tap LFO mode will learn a rhythm. Uh, very clever, and I think one of the only things that does it, literally as frantic as a rhythm as you want, um, it's it like a champion, just absolutely takes whatever thing you throw at it and will give you the LFO back and proper cycles of the LFO. It's not like an analog reset where it's like, oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of jumping into the, you know, you get the full triangle or saw or ramp or, yeah, seriously cool. Yeah, offline we'll have some discussion about engineers I've fought with who's, who just do the reset. Like, come on. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, you'll, you'll hear this philosophy come through a lot. And I, I was an instrument designer back in the 80s and 90s at Sequential and rolled into digital design. So that's why I really hammer on this stuff. Like, we need features in these instruments that are built for the way musicians and composers work rather than just, oh, this is what the circuit gave me. Yeah. Soapbox. Finished. Sorry about that. <laughs> Off the soft box, we've all got to go get a vector. That's where I think we've landed on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to show a couple other tricks. Like one thing I was having fun, you know, I said the reason I put the Zadar in this case was to force me to do more interesting things rather than just AD envelopes. And for example, I've got a really fast comb teeth sort of envelope happening on vector that I decided to wrap to the pulse width modulation on one of the oscillators. So that's just a sub octave. This is its normal oscillator out. As I start raising the depth of the envelope, so you have a nice chorus effect of it being changed very quickly, but I can also play around with the timing. And 
and different patterns, of course, by different envelopes. Compared to a straight tone, which is that. So that's something else I've been doing with the vector is forcing myself to say, let's not just put an LFO to the pulse width or an AD envelope. Let's find more complex envelope shapes to get some richer modulation going on. And also I have some other things happening. Like I have a slow random walk um, LFO pattern coming out of twin waves, actually playing around with the waveform mixture over on the braid. So if I bring braids up in this mix, going on in the waveform rather than being the same every single note this is like the attention to detail of the tone of the noise and the envelope that strikes the yeah. low pass gate is this something again that you feel is this lost when playing amongst others where you're maybe kind of fighting over that kind of average mean level that you're all working around or does this yeah. translate <laughs> it depends who you're playing with um if you're playing in a more of a traditional band context with keyboards and guitar and things like that, there tends to be quite a high average level mm -hmm. in a lot of genres that make subtleties like that not heard, unless you can talk them into cranking you way up so that you're in the forefront of the mix and then people can hear the subtlety. That's one difference. On the other hand, I have played with other people who sit back and leave space, um, such as Abe Mora, Earth 626, where I could really get into really spaced out spacious stuff or like the chimera trick that started that piece the really long psh, and we'll play around some envelope tricks with that remind me before we get done here to do some envelope tricks with chimera when they leave you space then you can start getting more subtle with the sounds and putting little details in for people to listen to and interestingly it's just a mixture of musicians when i play like with a particular guitarist and keyboardist the space fills up when i play with that guitarist on his own it opens up all of a sudden and He's a lot more sitting out. He sits out a lot more for some reason. Um, just different attitudes of people depending on, on the environment. And people have to learn to listen. You know, a lot of people who do modular are used to being a solo act. Yeah. And learning how to listen it can be, you know, that next level of challenge. I've played with other people and they're they, they, they following what they do. You go do your set and I will accent on top of that. And a lot of that comes down to listening and reacting to what they're doing and bringing in accents. Absolutely. I'm just pulling a link in for uh, Random Step, as Random was uh, mentioned in the chat. I'm heavily biased, of course, because it's uh, my module made with um, SSF. But regardless of whether you pick up a, ra a Random Step or not, watch that Random Step video. I try my best to make that an education in why I think Sample and Hold is important and interesting and incredibly musical in a variety of ways and not just random bleeps and bloops that we maybe think of sometimes when we think of Sample and Hold. So yeah, there's a link in there. I think it was Gavin that brought that one up. There's a link if you want to check it out. We've been at, we've, had, we've had a few requests just to interject. Can, yeah. can we have an explosion sound? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was reaching for cables for to go do. Um, Chimera. Chimera. It's a really cool start to that piece, that sound. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people... Yeah. So a lot of people use Chimera like this. Harsh metallics. And it excels at that. That's you know, what it was designed to do. But I like instead to take the pitch all the way down, slow down the triggers, long decay, um, take the effects over to the comb filter instead of. 
now you got these really fun slow down sounds. But you, but you can modulate that even further. So I'll go ahead and take like a smoothly random CV and put that to the effects amount for the comb filter. And the next strike will be different again. It's blending really well with the heavy rain on my open. Oh, you got heavy rain there? Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, that's one surface. You can tune this sound by choosing different surfaces. But instead, I'll take a complex envelope again. Oh, I need... Quickly, get me the... Get me more dopios. Here we go. I had to reach to the ground for that one. I'll split the trigger out. Have one of it continue to trigger Chimera. I'm on the white camera for this. Am I? Yes, good. You can see this. Yep. Then take the other one to do Zadar, uh, some complex, long, evolving envelope. And then take that to surface. And why have you stopped triggering for me? I'm here, Camara, talk to me. Oh, patch cord wasn't all the way. All right. So I have a multi humped envelope on Zadar to change the surface live during the, during the course of that note. Yeah. And you can play around with different envelope shapes. Different envelope shapes will give different effects. There's not one. And I have a little bit of a pitch bend going on that too right now. Just straight up, it's like that. Which is fun in its own right. Yeah. Then we'll take the random voltage off the effects mount. And then let's start cranking up some reverb. Oh, how about some delay? Yeah. It's right tonally where I was with, um, I had a live system I was using last year. It's not particularly being used that case much this year. Um, I, the modules came out and the setup changed, but minimal in the sense of wanting to kind of force attention onto those details and those sounds and you, yes. you can't force an audience to pay attention but i can certainly quite minimally explore these tonal shifts over time and that's completely what i indulged in it, it seemed to go down well but <laughs> maybe it didn't but that's where i was at with it and it's nice to see that there's some parallels in that with your setup as well that there's a tension to all these kind of smaller micro moments that add up to this overall bigger picture still relatively minimal it's not you know banging techno in any sense or huge industrial drones there's musically still a lot of space i think minimal yeah it's not super minimal but it's the right kind of tag to put on it it just yeah it's nice yeah i like having space so you can hear those details in the sound because for me you know the reason i use a modular instead of plug-in presets or keyboard presets is to craft new sounds and to try to put detail into those sounds. Now, I'm not saying that you always have to do what I do, because these are also fantastic boxes for doing hard techno, for doing noise, for doing a whole variety of different genres. But for me, I'm saying, look, I've got this tool. <laughs> Let's use it. And I purposely try to craft those detailed sounds, things you haven't heard before, hopefully. Maybe layer an, an element like a live drummer with it on top of this. Um, let's just go ahead and bring up, bring it again, because I like them so much. Along with the Chris Camera. And there'll be a crash on the next downbeat. I mean, just that, you know, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. I hope, uh, Jeff, check in the chat, you feel like you've had your explosion. <laughs> it's somewhat a weird alien ship explosion in the distance kind of vibe yeah. to it. <laughs> and I'll tune around surface and the other settings. There's also some interesting um, densities in the way that it layers sounds. You were talking about that you'll even change that feel um, as part of your triggering, which is something I'm, I'm going to go experiment with now as well. But a, a lot of these things too, they're kind of cool when you come up with a certain knob setting, but they go to the next level when you add modulation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing, there's a nice suggestion from uh, Bugman in the chat, um, an end of cycle trigger yeah. would, would be nice. And I was imagining this call and response of when the was kind of come all the way down, that then something else kind of fires in the distance. Yeah. And then this yeah. idea that the length of that will change, which he is pitch dependent on that module, right? That it's the fact you've pitched it right down, which is why it's so elongated. Yeah, that has a lot to do with it, but I've also cranked the decay parameter up all the way, and I could indeed modulate the, the delay parameter. Um, let's go ahead. And, so the way the chimera works is that it's not a one-shot sample. It's constantly building and layering together in granular style all these different sounds. Let's go ahead and bring it back up again and play with the pitch on it. I'll just pull up the modulation so you can hear it straight for now. So you can have insectoids with long delays. And it's just, you're doing the granular thing of just stepping through very slowly. But then we'll change the surface. Or effects, comb filter. The comb filter really interacts with that. A little bit more of a sky sound. See if Skype can even handle this. <laughs> Maybe. Or I can have that low sound with a short decay. So, yeah. You have independent control over the pitch and the decay, unlike just playing back a sample. They're certainly uh, then you're, satisfied yeah, with then. their explosions in the chat. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Metahedron uh, mentioned using the module for hi-hat sounds as well. Yeah. I really like the range of those WMD percussion modules. Um, I haven't tried them all, certainly not tried Crater, the new kick drum. But it's just it's this whole different tonal palette. Like you said, the feel switch was the big one for me. And the idea mm -hmm. that you know someone's pushing and pulling a tambourine the forward and the backward motion is different. And you can't play a tambourine unless you're hitting it with a stick without the forward and the backward motion. And it goes some yeah. way to kind of mimicking that and then resetting it on odd beats, playing it irregularly. So there's a set of like four animated feels, if you like, but they're not being triggered in a kind of group of four notes. Again, it starts to play into this polymetric thing of everything overlapping over the bar patterns seem much bigger um nick jackson asked which comb filter it's actually on the module itself yeah. there's a there's an effect knob and type switch uh, yeah normally it's a bit crusher or mm -hmm. a down sampler yeah and since this is mainly a metallic sound module people tend to use those first two effects more often to get a more harsh sound but the third setting is that comb filter and you can dial in a tone with the effects amount but then with cd it really comes to life um, let me just yeah. drop a link. Oh, you're catching up. I saw, I saw while I was wondering one thing is that the, the chat was flying by earlier when I got a glance at the computer. I don't know how you're keeping up with it. Um, but I will say, you know, what you're talking about, those different settings, you know, one, it gets back to what I consider to be a human feel. Not necessarily it was a human sound or human instrument, but interjecting changes. And yeah. two, this long form evolution. This is why I've been... I've been really listening to a lot of Steve Roche lately, and he'll have one sequence playing for quite a long time, but he has other layers of other sequences applying accents at different points in time that make it much more interesting. You've gone silent, Ben. Ben, you're muted.
Oh, Ben, you're still muted. I can't hear you. Maybe it's just on my end. Ah, now, now you're back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry to be talking on top of you. I apologize. Remember, there's a 30 second delay. So if, if people are not hearing Ben, it's it will. Even though he saw your chat, it'll take a while for him to react. Yeah, it's ooh, it's now back on the left hand side. Oh, where's the cool Dalek sound live stream? I'd rather have yeah. that than uh. Yeah, it's on your left channel. Than this mono switch, business. mono switch. There you go. You're back. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I wasn't muted. No human error. Yay! You can still take a drink. Um, <laughs> Yeah, definitely not muted. I've had to switch audio driver, so I maybe sound a little different. I did go left, and I should be back. Um, yeah. Hmm. No idea what that was, but as long as you can hear me and the chat can hear me, I'm still seeing bits of the chat against of the delay. The delay. We can't hear you. Ah, he's back. Right, they've got me. Okay. You, yeah. You've now, from this point, another thirty seconds of. Well, they haven't because they can't hear this for thirty seconds. Move <laughs> on. <laughs> We're back. So. People in the chat do ask more questions. Um, we've been streaming for a couple of hours. We're in no huge rush to go. And there are questions yeah. to get to, but specifically around this patch we've just been looking at. Um, let's get those kind of relevant yeah. questions in before I go back to ones from earlier in the stream. Yeah, I, I'll play you one more trick from that particular piece, and then I'm going to move over to the other camera and we'll start answering questions. Um, I was also playing around with the way I was triggering plonk. Um, to start off with only downbeat sounds and then start adding some individual beats in between. So I was taking a copy of the transposition voltage, running that into the CV input on good old plonk here, taking a slow gate. Let me grab one of my long cables here and repurpose it. Oh yeah, I'll just go ahead and repurpose this one mm -hmm. to go ahead and trigger plonk. And let's bring plonk up in the mix. Where are you? But then if I wanted to make it have some variation, I would take a pattern off of milligrids, run it through a probability, so only a few of those would get through, run that to an OR switch, then take my normal once every measure, run that to the other side of an OR switch, and take the combination out to trigger plonk. So the extra hits are coming from Grid's snare pattern being filtered through probability. So there's always a hit on the downbeat, no matter what the skipper's doing, but it's having these additional things. I can go ahead and just dial all the way out. So it's just have the downbeat. Need some, br some brain doing drums here underneath us. There we go. Or I can go ahead and dial in additional hits. Now, rather than using a random gate signal, I am using a pattern so the, so the hits make sense to what a drummer might be doing, but then I'm randomly dropping some out rather than just taking a random gates from like a woggle bug or something like that. It's a really important thing for me with any probability is that probability over defined patterns as opposed to just every beat will potentially fire a given yeah. percentage of the time. Yeah. Yeah, so you see where it's on the same beats that brain's hitting on the drum loop rather than it just being randomness. And again, that chaotic breakdown of randomness can also just be wonderful sensory overload, but I'm very groove oriented in my own stuff yeah yeah um dgp uh, said they'd love to see some more jamming so let's any re relevant questions and then yeah another minute or so of a little jam would be cool um and as i said earlier the uh, demos that chris pre-prepared that we played the videos of earlier will certainly be available for chris's patreon supporters which is patreon.com forward slash learning modular 
if you'd like access to yeah. courses, exclusive content. There's a lot of posts documenting this whole live system over a much larger period of time. It's been interesting to follow that along. Yeah, this this system has evolved certainly over time. I'm just pulling up some loops. Someone asked for a jam, so I figured I better get some loops ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there we go. Dial up to 90. Any other questions on this system? Not particularly for the patch. We've a good amount of questions generally. Um, so if you're happy to play for a couple of minutes, that'd be great. Yeah, let's go ahead and um, I just loading up. I'm falling back on my favorites, just some various patterns by brain. So I'm going to make sure that Bitbox is in play mode, otherwise it won't sync. Stop Pamela's workout for at least a couple seconds for Bitbox to reset. Start Pamela. Pre queue the loop on the Bitbox. Okay. And then let's start adding in, let's say, some kicks to begin with since his kick is pretty sparse in there. So let's get the kick out from Milligrids. Go to my favorite SSF. Get a little more tonality where he is. Maybe do some hats over top of that. Yeah, let's go ahead and do hats by blending together a couple different beats. So I'll do the hat pattern from Grids as well as some random beats as well. Do, 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 do. I can hear you, Ben. I may as well. <laughs> I may as well let the live chat hear me as well. I was muted for them. Um, I've lost you. Yeah. You've gone entirely bl uh, black screen through Skype. I don't know if a oh, okay. camera's maybe switched off or... Yeah, this particular camera is known to overheat. So I can either change cameras or I can bring back this camera. It will come to life here in a second. There we go. There we go. Yeah, this camera can go bad on me occasionally. Okay. Either that or it said don't share what you're doing. I don't know why. Yep. Cool. I'll mute myself again there we go. and leave you to it. Maybe get a different drum pattern here. Oh, I like that better. That works better. So I changed what pattern I was using from grids there. And let's take the hi-hat out to mid on Crucible. Maybe a real sound. And now let's get a random pattern thrown on top of that by taking well, my probability here and run that to the other trigger input. Crucible. All right, now let's play around with maybe choking those. I'm gonna take the accent out from that. I'm going to invert it, run that into my trigger to gate converter, and then take that out to choke. So most notes are choked, there's some long ones getting through. Now I'm taking that as the accent from Grizz, but I could just open up another channel on Euclidean to be the choke. Maybe some echo on that as well. And to make it a little bit more interesting, let's get some random probability on the length of that choke. It may be a stranger sound. And 
And let's go ahead and get some probability happening for some of the kick drum sounds as well, just for fun. I guess I could even patch my keyboard over into the pitch side. Uh, where's your full proactive input? If I want to start transposing this around. and change loops. Yeah, they don't have the ride symbol interfering with all this other stuff now. There we go. Get a little funkier on the symbols by making random decays. Very nice, and that's generated some more questions as well. Um, <laughs> Keiko or uh, Kako in the chat, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, donation. Heimbach as well, who's here? I was told not to tell you Heimbach's here. I'm not sure why. <laughs> uh, You're supposed to be on vacation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Keiko uh, vector videos on this channel. Cool. Just dropped a link in for some vector videos. Uh, from the live chat as well, um, which I'll be leaving open to go watch later on. Uh, cool. Hello, Dimleaf. Uh, just got off work and immediately had to hop on. Um, Jeff Hamill says it reminds him of the quote vintage, unquote industrial that he grew up on. Uh, <laughs> Bugman was dying for you to up the tempo. <laughs> maybe we can do that. Yeah, maybe <laughs> 160. If you've got a BPM readout, was the uh, let me see. Let me. 160 is pushing things a little bit, but I can do like 120. Ooh, I got some crazy stuff here too. Um, this has been a while since I played my loop set. Now that's not very interesting. Yeah. Uh, metahedron and effects. This may sound like crap, but we'll find out. Okay. <laughs> metahedron and effects. Thank you very much for the super chat. As I say, we'll find a way to collectively use that. <laughs> had a request for speed car <laughs> 242 bpm um, 
just imagine this in double time. That's near enough too far too. Well, I can pull it up a little bit. <laughs> I tend to be a down tempo person, but it's fun to goof off. Down, yeah, new age down tempo was the dank down tempo, new age. I think. Oh yeah, new age down tempo. I swear that's the genre. I'm gonna start contacting labels. <laughs> okay, so that did generate some questions. Some with um, <laughs> easier answers than others. Jeff, check. Uh, are you throwing in two triggers into the crucible for the bell mode? Yes, I am. The way that um, Crucible works is that one patch is edge, one trigger input is edge, the other trigger input is mid. But if both triggers hit at the same time, then it does a bell sound. Yeah. So that's how you get three different sounds out of the Crucible with two trigger ends. Mm -hmm. But also the reason why I don't use just one pattern generator to feed Crucible, I'll use something different, such as Euclidean circles as well. And then I can play around with densities, either using probability or how many notes are in my Euclidean circles pattern. Yeah. Another super chat from uh, Is Not. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone that's here. Um, go hit the thumbs up if you'd like to support, if nothing yeah, else. Yeah, particularly on a weekday. Thanks for everyone for coming out. appreciate it. Generally, just as we get into questions, our weekday, this kind of time, on a weekday or a weekend better for live streams. We'll be looking to continue this idea of feeding the monster TARDIS Space case. Space case, whatever it might be. Um, and generally, it's good just to know what works. We do them at 8 p.m. UK, if anyone's curious, because Europe's still up, it's not too late, and then across America is awake as well. I appreciate if you're in the US, it being evening, your time is probably better, but I would be asleep. Um, so, yeah, weekday or, or weekend. If you can just throw that in the chat, that would be useful. Go give the video a thumbs up as well, if you'd like to support. That's really handy to get YouTube to push this out as a requested video which is great. So, on to um, questions. Still the ones generated by uh, the jamming. Uh, okay. Derek asked, is it Entity making that 303-like sound? Yeah, it is. That bow bow. Yeah. Um. It's normally just a nice muted kick, mm. but by putting up their harmonics... And this is why I like Entity Percussion over the Entity Bass Synthesizer. The Bass Synthesizer does a saturation on the kick for, as their accent, but the Entity Percussion has a wave holder. That's where you get this. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. I find it has a lot of range. I like it. Yep. Uh, DB Powell asked what was the bass line sound probably meant entity as well it was entity and i just uh, i decided to go ahead and live patch re-pitching it from the dofer mini keyboard so let's bring it back up again yeah so i know i saw a couple of people when they saw the dofer mini keyboard like you've got to be kidding me no i do not play keith emerson licks on it <laughs> but it's a, been a very useful tool to just say, I need to transpose and I can't quite hit what I'm going for. Oh, I can just change quickly there and hit semitones. Yeah. Um, have you any videos on Euclidean circles? Um, I did one and I, I think it may be had been a patreon only video on the euclidean circles giant head scenario hi um where i was showing how i was trying to learn how to layer euclidean circles with other sounds and i found my own particular approach was if i started with euclidean circles for some reason i had trouble layering with it but if i i mean if i started with another sound then brought in Euclidean circles, I'd have difficulty. But if I started with Euclidean circles, then it was easier for me to layer sounds on top of it. I've not done a video on it. One thing I want to get into is um, at Synthplex last year, there was an interesting talk on different rhythms. And particularly what caught my ear was uh, Indian tall rhythms, where something may be keeping like a steady eighth note, but the other one may be uh, every third or every fifth. 
And in the end, they resolved to get back onto like a 16-bit pattern. I thought that's fascinated me. And in Euclidean Circles version 2, you can program your own patterns into them. So when I've got some spare time, I'm going to program some tall rhythms into this and have some fun doing some left and right drums to get that bit of interplay between similar drum sounds but having that interaction, two-hand type of playing. Yeah. Um, just to save me a bit of typing and everyone hear me hammering the keyboard, <laughs> I've now, with having to switch uh, sound devices, I've lost my muting mechanism for the mics. You can hear all my intense typing. Um, talk about maybe starting an hour later would be helpful in the UK, possibly for shorter streams. Um, that's tricky for me with how early my daughter wakes me up when we go for three hours <laughs> <laughs> on these streams. Cause it takes me a good hour to wind down. It's so much kind of mental gymnastics, trying to just watch the technology, listen to Chris, watch Chris and the chat. It's a, it's a little bit full on. So it takes me a good hour and yeah, it, it then kills me the next day. But um one for the reason I bring Euclidean circles up was Jeff said, uh, "Can we focus it on a? Uh, can we focus on it a little bit? Um, we don't have time to really demo Euclidean circles full on, but Jeff, maybe come. Is there a specific thing we could get into that wouldn't take so long? Is it a general? What is a Euclidean rhythm? Is it? Yeah, if there's maybe a, a slightly shorter specific thing, but is there anything that comes to, to mind for you, Chris? The idea of getting into." Uh, well, it just said, can we focus on Euclidean? It wasn't just oh, like Euclidean circles. but Literally, can we focus on it? Um, Euclidean patterns, it's worth reading You know, at least the uh, intro to the paper on Euclidean patterns. Yeah. It was found that if you use this particular way of dividing beats across a fixed length, like spacings of threes, and then you make it up the end, spacings of... You know, how do you distribute a certain number of beats, say five beats, as evenly as possible across your entire l pattern length, which is maybe 16 in the case of Euclidean circles. And using some math from the mathematician Euclid, which seemed to have other applications in nuclear physics and all this other stuff, they found that the beats were landing in the same places that were common in non-Western music, particularly African, Middle Eastern, et cetera, type patterns, particularly a lot of Latin patterns. So Euclidean circles is like a way of subdividing beats without being quarter notes, 16th notes, eighth notes. Instead of like, well, let's just spread out the beats across our measure. Offset them if you like. You can change where the downbeat is and then see what you can do with that. And um, when you start playing with Euclidean circles from scratch, you can just kind of go like, well, you know, um, two, four, and eight work. <laughs> the other ones are a little offbeat. Yeah. But I love it to layer with other things. So rather than using it as a solo percussion element, um, for example, let's go ahead and bring in my... Now, slow down my tempo from a little bit here. Not like that I'm a down tempo guy. And let's have the kick triggered from Euclidean. Top one. Bring up SSF. Pull out the echo for now. I mean, your four on the floor is very obvious. Yeah. But if you go to, like, three... Three doesn't go into 16, so there's some uneven spacing. Yeah. Now, if you're into, like, burial, you know, you want to try to recreate that sound, that's kind of fun. But you pour on the floor. But then you go to five. Even spacing for the first four, more spacing for the last. Six is one of my favorites. It's yeah. a very common pattern. As soon as you get that, um, duh, good, duh, good, duh, good, yeah. duh. Good that kind of thing going yeah. over the top. Yeah. But particularly when it comes to hi-hats, when I'm trying to do something unusual with the hat sounds, let's pull this out quickly. It's fun to go up to some of the higher numbers. Yeah, they start to feel and more I, like a random skip than a... The rhythm, it's almost like yeah. you're, you're expecting the, all the 16th notes and there's just an occasional dip. Yeah. So rather than go... Or here's 16. I like it better to just drop a few holes in that. Yeah. An important 
a really useful thing to note is they don't have to be 16 steps long. You can divide Euclidean rhythms right. into any step length, certainly on Euclidean circles, up to 16. So it could be a 15-step yeah. pattern with seven beats, as evenly distributed yeah. as possible across that. Yeah. Just changes length by one. Again. Now, the way I have my system patched is I have Pamela sending a reset signal to Euclidean every four measures. So even if I go off on some strange durations, like this, it'll come back to the one after, after four measures. Yeah. I put a link in the chat that I'll just bring up in the browser, and I'll copy the link in again. There is a groovemechanics.com forward slash Euclid, which again link is there in the chat is a um a sequencer a euclidean sequencer it just plays 909 samples which is fine um you set the step length the amount of pulses and then if you offset that rhythm or not and it's a very visual interesting and that's important if you're interested resource just browser based yeah um, very visual very musical uh, very easily lets you go i wonder what a step of the 15 steps against 16 steps is like when I try and put four beats in yeah. them or it's a great way to get going there's there's you a 15 versus 16 four beats in each and then my reset hits yeah it reminds me of that you used to be a, a grade eight, which is the final of the eight instrumental academic grades you can sit, which I used to do mm. a lot of when I was teaching. I had quite a lot of grade eight students looking to go into university to continue studying things like that. And there was a piece that went from four four, a bar of four four, to a bar of seven eight, but the a, but the uh -huh. accent stuck every other beat. So it would start on the downbeat, and then the offbeat was unaccented. But then as you got into the 7-8 bar, oh, okay. that would then shift off as it came back. So you'd move from on-beat and off-beat accents purely because the music was moving from 4-4 four, four to 7-8 measures. But it was still that like loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet. But everything around that changed. And it was always a really interesting mm -hmm. thing to hear that shift as the bars are rolling round. Yeah. Yeah. I, creating those fun overlapping patterns is something I'm into, but I also kind of realized the other night when I was thinking that I guess I kind of take almost like a granular sound approach to the way that I build up rhythms is I really think in terms of densities, you know, how many notes inside a certain amount of time as, as opposed to many, how many sound grains in a certain amount yeah. of time is it dense and continuous. Is it very sparse? Are there transpositions happening? And I just, it occurred to me that I was taking a granular like approach to the way I like to build up and release tension in percussion lines by just playing with densities of notes yeah cool well we'll get start blasting into some of these questions there's some great talks on um books on geometry and rhythm uh, rhythm in general cool. um i'm going to change cameras so i can come actually look at you okay uh, well, i'll switch <laughs> over the view as you move across so uh, questions um aaron taylor waldman asked says they're definitely interested in the raga and tabla rhythms have you any suggested resource or reading on that no um fortunately well that's i think it's something definitely worth exploring um i just you know attended a really interesting talk of synth tech last it's synth um best synth fest i'm getting all my shows confused <laughs> synth plex, synthplex synthplex yeah. not synth fest uk but synthplex <laughs> that just had me off and going on that but then when you start doing wikipedia on things like indian rhythms then you'll start finding all these other resources yeah uh -huh. uh, Bugman asked, is it possible, and I don't know if they may just meant is it possible for you to do now or possible in general. Let's take it they meant generally. Um, to do a classic Amen break, you could have all the slices of the Amen break in a sampler to trigger through or to sequence through. To try and recreate the structure of the beats, yes, you could program that on a rhythm sequencer. You mm -hmm. would need to be firing off... Um, accents and velocities are different samples for the loud and the quiet snare drums but it just wouldn't have that sound that chopped audio just doesn't it's never the same 
you know, doing it from one shots to actually chopping. It's interesting, the Erica Pico drums, the first one that plays samples, has uh, kick snare samples from, uh, it's already like a sped up jungle drum break. So it's got the hi-hats after it. There's a kick that kind of goes, tick, 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 and it's and it yeah. it doesn't, you know, like an, an old school sampler would, the pitch will then stretch and condense that rhythm. So it's quite interesting using it and then having to make the rest of the patch fit. So, all right, I've got the little chunk of a sample that I like. I'm going to have to just tempo down until I lock in or up. That's quite cool. Or, or go, yeah, as I say, old school sampler is I'm going to have to pitch it down. If I want to stretch that out, I'll go up even further. At which point I tend to want a bit more reinforcement in the low end, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could sit down and, and chart out the, the amen break. Yeah. And then recreate it, as you say, with a pattern sequence. Um, but you triggered something else. I really love the um, just the chittering little sounds yeah. that you get quite often with, with drum and bass stuff. And that's another set of loops I have in there is I'll go ahead and pull the drum and bass stuff at double the tempo that I'm playing at, just to have that going along on top. That's that all whole. Um, I ended up on a <laughs> quite a lot of admin to do this week, so I had a, found a great documentary on dub, and then it went into kind of UK garage, UK electronic music cult history. Um, I'll try and find the chat, maybe if if not. Yeah, I have to find that. I've I've watched the uh, the um, dub, the historical one on Jamaican dub, mm. um, dub echoes, I think it's called. I haven't heard of that. This one. one was UK sound, and they went through rave garage. Um, just moving through and where it all came from it was really good mm -hmm. um and they got into earlier dubstep and hearing that like very kind of dark rumbling techno influence over the dub influence way kind of pre-skrillex pre-huge kind of full-on fm distorted bass lines those kind of like softer kind of wobbling basses that had that it's like Benga's album was was one of the ones that came up which it was one of the first ones i heard at the time scream and Benga were quite big in the uk um and they well they had a radio one show is where i heard all that stuff originally but they would have all this double time rhythm above the slower half time beats and i think that's what really drove it in a club sense originally before it all got yeah super huge and bombastic and the kind of edm dubstep that people maybe think of when they hear that word but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Aaron Taylor Wallman again asked, "Have you tried tides for unusual LFO or envelope shapes?" I have not. Um, I know a lot. Of, there's a lot of tides fans out there, as well as Batumi, etc. Um, you know, I've been playing much more with Zadar. I have a um, Studio Electronics ST16 because what I like about that is not only is can it be continuous LFO, you can fire off the LFO shapes as one shots as well. That's a feature you're starting to see appear in more LFOs, mm. such as um, Kermit Mark III, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really like Tides. I really like Tides as an oscillator more. <laughs> just It just takes to be modulated so well. I love the idea of this skewing of a triangle to a falling or rising ramp that then feeds a folder. So you're kind of shifting this into the folding and the filtering. And also the yeah. general curve control as well. It's really powerful. Um, for envelopes, it kind of felt like a peg on steroids. Uh, was how it was described to me early on. Um, the 4MS peg was the first kind of tempo-based. Most pingable envelope generator. For those who are wondering what peg is. Yeah, peg is not Pamela's sister. <laughs> Peggy. Uh, yeah, peg. The pingable envelope generator. Yeah, the first kind. You you got a maths and you got a peg. That was the thing. Um, <laughs> one is analog one, one's, one's doing the digital tempo sync stuff um, Omri Cohen asked how is the DLD compared, compared to the Chrono Blob 2 I haven't used a Chrono Blob 2 I've used a Chrono Blob 1 and um, I just didn't get along with it I know there's a lot of fans who really like Chrono Blob and I like tape deteriorating sounds that's why I have a filter and the feedback path for my DLD the DLD is basically Really long, hugely long memory. Mm -hmm. um, very easy to choose different clock divisions for the left and right channels. Very graphical in terms of having a knob to go from like, you know, dotted notes all the way to every 16 beats. And um, it's basically super clean, as opposed to the Chrono Blob's idea was something is purposely malleable. It has some distortion. It wobbles when you change its tempo as opposed to doing a crossfade or a glitch like the DLD does. So they're very different beasts. Um, 
you know, I am a fan of old reggae style dubs. So I, I do like the tape echo sort of idea that the Chrono Bob was trying to go for. But um, version two, version one, I didn't get along with. I sold it and got a DLD right before version two came out. Mm. So I missed that boat. Yeah, it, it's the tape mode is the speeding up of the the delay. I, it, I, there's no like drive and wobble emulation, I think, or is there? There's some distortion in the feedback that's supposed to be tapish. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. I thought it was the, as you said, that it's not, it's, it's not a magneto in terms of having capstan wobble, things mm. like that. But, um, yeah, I'm all about that. <laughs> a friend, a friend <laughs> said, I want a cheapish tape echo kind of sub 300 pounds of which they're around. There's copycats and echo decks and other things at under 300 pounds around eBay. And they said, but I want it to be really clean. I was just like, well, why bother with tape? Like just don't, yeah. don't bother. The emulations are so good. Magneto, loads of guitar pedals do a killer tape delay. The delay by Valhalla, if you're in software, is exceptional, and its tape mode is fantastic. And it can be as clean as you want with just a colour of tape. But for me, if I'm going to bother with the mechanical, awkward things that they are, <laughs> I just I want it, warts and all. And I'll live with Power Home. I'll live with... Uh, like, <laughs> and I'll figure it out later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I kind of just really power supply caps, new power supply caps. Yeah, <laughs> um, I I really like the make noise um, Echophon. I mm. use that quite a bit in this case before I you know ended up with DLD. Among other things, like having the transposition in the feedback path or in front, um, it has a really great vary speeding when you change the clock going into it. So instead of just turning the front control, I'll change the division that Pamela's feeding it. And then the echo funk will roll as it finds that new division. And it's, I love that effect. Yeah. Um, just as it saves a copy and paste, I'll jump forward to one from Derek uh, Doherty. Uh, the expander, the DB25 expander for WMD. Yeah. How are you using that in that case in terms of kind of justifying the space it takes? Um, <laughs> is it for recording? Is it for outboard effects? How is that being used? It's for recording. It's so that if I want to do some serious composition on this case, which is what I was, it was the only thing I had when the monster was being rebuilt, so that I could record individual stems if I want to get serious about remixing performance later on. The way that the DB25 breakout works is that it has your master stereo output. So you've got your stereo mix, but then it has the 14 individual inputs, including the expander, but it, it's all pre fader. So you don't get the effects, you don't get the panning. But I just put it in there as a safety net to be able to record my stems. If I did a jam, I thought that was really good, but the kick drum was way too loud or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, uh, I just caught the last uh, bit of the name, but Nemborg, uh, question for later. Have you guys tried out the Soma Pulsar 23 yet? Um, he was imagining it over one of the earlier jams. Hmm, I have not. What is it? I haven't either. So it's Soma that make the Lyra 8. They have a drum machine, the Pulsar 23. Okay. Um, it's got the metal touch plates to loop. Each thing can be a looper on itself and of different lengths. It's all on crocodile clips. Okay. Um, there's some jack-ins that feed the crocodile clips with the idea that, I guess, a bit like the all flesh, you can touch them, you can throw whatever on them. Um, you can go Scott Yeager on it with the food on the turntable, but actually have the food influence the patch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic video. If no one's seen that, that is well worth me just peeling off for a second. Uh, Scott <laughs> Yeager at... Um... I do have yeah. Landscape FM's All Flesh, and I will occasionally use that as a performance element with this case. Because, you know, with the Nano Garden, etc., putting on an, a performance, I think, is part of taking this thing out live. I always set up turned around so people see the case they don't see me so they see all the knob turning they see the nano garden but it's really fun with all flesh just to be able to like hold one end in your hand discreetly and then like touch the other ones to your forehead or to your lips or to your ear to close the circuit and cause something to happen and it just freaks people out when you do that um really enjoy doing that <laughs> yeah that was a the next question was that but very very important uh break as people are going to see if people haven't, I know you I appreciate you can't hear this, but just to make you go click on this link, <laughs> um, there is a turntable. Um, I don't know why it's so blurred. It's also not loading, but uh, the turntable. Yeah, bandwidth is killed. There we go. There's some meats, tomatoes, gherkins. 
<laughs> um, I'll stop playing it just in case um, it does kill Bandit. <laughs> Go click the link. The link is in the live chat. Um, just to add to that, because it was one of the questions from Constantine, I really like the All Flesh. It's a really interesting idea. It was Robert uh, Rob Lowe that, that had them at one of the Brighton meets, and it was it was him playing with it. It was a kind of tipping point to trying those out. Yeah, actually, I used them. You know, unsolicited plug coming. I used them more before I got a mutes in my case, because I would also use them to temporarily mix together triggers and turn triggers on and off and things like that as well. Now that I have mutes with the nice toggle switches and the temporary switch, I'll, I'll use that more for that. Non days, I'm using all flesh for more theatrical stuff, like having um, foreign voices playing backwards on one of the distings, going through the all flesh and just touch one sensor to my lips. Suddenly, this burst of backwards voices come out, and um, I, I have fun doing that theatrically. Mm. Uh, Francesco asked, um, talking about the dimensions, there's no one U roll in your case. Is that because the width of the case um, is a, a specific and precise choice? Uh, just wondering about having the dope for keyboard on a free U to one U adapter. I guess getting yeah. that. We talked a lot this about this a lot, I think, in the <laughs> first episode. It's like alternate keyboards, and boy, a one U keyboard would be awesome. Yeah. Um, Not for that case, um, though. Pulp Logic... <laughs> Um, Pulp Logic, I think, had the hmm. Korg Volca keyboard as both a 1U and as a 3U, but they're no longer available. I wanted to get those because they, they have a relatively small footprint. Um, yeah, the, the case dimensions were somewhat limited by getting it into carry-on. And um, if I rebuilt the case, I would take measurements again and see if I could fit a 1U row in each half because I would take a lot of utilities out and be able to put them in those rows and free up module space for other things. But I really just like the idea of being able to take this thing, jump on a Southwest flight and go somewhere and play. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep blasting through questions. Um, what has been the most hard or frustrating module to learn? Hmm. In this case or just in general? <laughs> uh, have a think in general. For me, just to speak generally, sometimes... And it often centers around having deadlines and, and video demos to make, so I have to kind of crunch through it quickly. We all have days where we don't feel it, or we do, or we're motivated, or we're not. And they're not always tied to what's necessarily a more complex module or not for me. It isn't that the seemingly more feature-packed, menu-driven one is actually more daunting sometimes. Um, it, it's generally feel and mood of the day that, that will kind of yeah. make it a frustrating process or not but that's also to do with my own patching and kind of artistic practice of am i just feeling it you know you are you wanting to write sequences and make music that day sometimes that can be incredibly frustrating just picking up a guitar some days it's really enjoyable some days it's banging your head on a wall for no reason um and that definitely comes across into the modular for me i'd struggle to pick yeah. a, a hardest to learn I can think of a couple of examples of where either I gave up or the effort was worth it. I mean, I had the same aversion to deep menu diving, and my eyesight's not great. Um, I have contacts to correct it, but it's still an issue, particularly in low lighting. So these really tiny LCD displays mm -hmm. with five lines of text, I just can't, I can't deal with those modules. I mean, just say, I'm sorry, I can't use you no matter what you have. Um, but what the... The biggest problem is preconceived notions, I think, and instant gratification. Like when I first got a marbles, it didn't do what I was hoping it was going to do. But I said, you know, I'm sure there's something in here I can use. So I just had to keep at it for weeks of learning to use marbles on its own terms. One of the things about marbles is that on the trigger outputs, the T's, it can do supposed kick and snare type patterns as one of its options. Compared to grids, I think the patterns are wanting. So I, initially I thought, oh, I can replace grids with marbles. No, I can't. But then when I started saying, ah, but it does give me an alternate set of patterns I can use for layering or for off-beat accents, and it's giving me these CV changes that are not happening every quarter or whatever, but happening on a rhythmic sense. When I started looking at marbles that way, then now it's an essential part of that case. But it took a several weeks to get there and for me i'm usually like sit down with a module for a day or two to master it um so that, that took some time 
And the other thing that occasionally makes me frustrated is actually modules that are too clean. Um, I like character in modules. You know, I have 20 different filters, not just to have 20 identical sounding clean filters. I want each one to have a character. And every now and then I've gotten a filter, I go, I'm not feeling you. You know, you're, you're not doing enough to the sound going through you and you're out. So it's not necessarily frustrating to learn, but just like not my aesthetic. Yeah. So do you have a clean filter as a go-to, but you just want one? Or is there none at all? Well, in the in that case, it was the Rossum Evolution. Okay. Because when I first got the Rossum Evolution and tried to do the, you know, just quick patching, it was like, oh, kind of flat, isn't it? Oh. But then I learned how to push it and find all these variations with the different numbers of poles and things like that inside of it. Um, and now it's the first filter I'll use quite often because if I want clean, it will give me clean and then I can go off base from there with it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, a bit of a joke question, so I'll give you a, well, not a joke <laughs> answer, but a genuine one. Um, complete opposite reverse question, easiest module to learn. That was a molt. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't what do. uh, the easiest for me to learn if you know i think aaron's i don't know whether you're joking around or not but the easiest to learn was ones that were familiar from other things so a filter that had an input an output a cutoff and resonance and a cv over that where when, as soon as i realized okay i plug my envelope in there it's kind of doing what all the vintage gear that i'd gone through was doing so that felt familiar to me an oscillator is kind of equally simple but the initial thought, if you've not used them before outside of keyboard synths, is why isn't the sound turning off? And it's not the oscillator's yeah. fault. It's just a case of you maybe unaware at first that it doesn't turn off. <laughs> Same with envelopes. An envelope generator is a basic ADSR is a very simple thing, effectively, that you plug a gate in, it attacks, decays, sustains, and releases, and you patch that somewhere else. But at first, I thought, where does the sound go? Why is the sound not going through my envelope? Because that was at the end of this chain on all these vintage mono synths and, and bits of polys as well, that that's the last stage. I move these faders think, on a Juno. Things or, go through that. Yeah, 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 yeah. you just think that's that's where the sound goes. Um, so they're very seemingly simple modules, but they're the kind of head against yeah. the wall when you get started. I keep glancing off that direction because that's where the TARDIS is, and I'm just staring at it thinking, okay, what... Well, what parts of you have given me a challenge? Um, something that, yeah, that kind of fits in between, as you say, like an envelope generator, like an ADSR, was very normal for me. And I was fortunate that when I was a teenager, I said, I want to take synthesizer lessons. The teacher started me on a modular. So I'm used to thinking that way, and I have that advantage, and I'm happy for that. But using Zadar was interesting because it's so different than an ADSR. The parameters are different. Rather than having attack rate, decay rate, sustain level, release rate. It's like shape, dura overall duration, squeeze in X, squeeze in Y. Mm. And that's not at all like an ADSR. No. And at first, you, if you start using it, you go, no, this makes no sense. But once you can say, forget ADSR, it's actually very easy to use and very immediate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron's come back and said, good answers. Uh, maybe a better question would be what was seemingly complicated but was actually relatively easy to use. I'll give one answer before we jump back to some other questions. Um, something like the CV thing or VCMC from Bafaco where you think, God, making CV control MIDI must be a pain. And it seems like it may have a, a big menu. Now, there's a little bit of encoder pressing um, on the CV thing, which is a video that I'm working on for Friday, this coming Friday. But it's really simple in that it's, it's what do you want it to do? So you press the encoder on the, one of the eight inputs, just scroll to number two, push it. You're presented things like function or MIDI channel, MIDI channel one. What do I want the function to be? Is it a note? Is it a gate? Is it a MIDI CC? Is it a clock message? Okay, it's CC because I know I want to control CC21 on my pedal. So it's just a little bit of pressing as to, okay, channel two, function, CC, CC number 21, done. And then it remembers it and it's finished. But that seemed like a complicated thing for me when the VCMC was announced as, oh, this must be a pain, like getting all these MIDI messages. And it wasn't. It's very flat menu. Yeah. It's just a lot of, you've got to do it eight times over. But once it's set, it's set. So things like that usually are the ones for me. 
Yeah, probably something in that realm is also like the expert sleepers fader host. Mm. Because Oz built this amazing thing that can do everything simultaneously. But when you start using it, you go, wait a second, why isn't this going to that? And I changed MIDI channel and all my output ratings, routings have changed. And then there's an online web interface. It's, oh, great, Excel spreadsheet. But once you, you know, kind of get past this, you go, oh, it's very easy for me to say, I want this to do this on this output. Um, yeah, that's another case of like, oh, this is going to be daunting. I'm really going to have to sit down and screw on the thinking cap. But once you get his logic, oh, I can do whatever I want with it. Yeah, the CV OCD and the Mutant Brain, which is based on it, the MIDI to CV from Hex Inverter. Same kind of thing, fire up Chrome. There's four CV outputs and 12 gates, is it? It's just, what do I want them to be? Okay, well, I want a clock, that can be output one. I want a reset, that can be output two. I want CV1 to be mid MIDI channel 1, I want CV2 to be mid channel 2. It's just a lot of kind of this is this, this is that, this is this. Lots of simple things, kind of repetitive tasks more than anything. Um, question from Jeff Check. Uh, Chris, have you ever worked with a single origin rack, single manufacturer rack? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I, I, well, okay, one exception. When I made my first learning modular synthesis course, I thought it'd be easier for people to grasp if I started with one manufacturer. So I did a top row of all of the Roland modules. Um, part of it's because, you know, they're based on the old Roland System 100 stuff. They're very meat and potatoes, straightforward, easy to use. And I, I really thought when Roland came out, oh, Guitar Center is going to sell modular. They're going to dominate the world. I was wrong. You know, that's not at all what happened. Um, but my own personal aesthetic is I, I prefer variety. So I will seek out different modules from different manufacturers rather than making one manufacturer thing. Now, there's some really cool systems. Like I've looked at the um, Make Noise Music Concrete system, for example, the Erica Fusion drone system. Things like that really interest me as an instrument. Yeah. But for my own for my own system, I'll custom build it out of a variety of modules because I like the variety. Yeah. That's like, for example, the percussion voices in the TARDIS are like several different manufacturers, each a different synthesis engine just because I'm pushing the variety part of it. Um, yeah, um, again, just to save a bit of hammering on the keyboard. Uh, Wombra in the chat asked, do we, do we know of a service that assembles DIY for people? Um, he's got a DIY kit. Um, or says it, I have one, I think they mean DIY kit, uh, that they don't want to build anymore. Um, message me somewhere was my response. Um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, email if you want. Tell me where I can find you, and I'll send you a message after this before I go to bed. Um, There's a lot of builders who are building the common modules, like the micro braids and things like that, but will also take on other projects to order for you. Yeah, where are you based? Probably a better one. Chris might have a better idea yeah. for the US market. I have a few friends here in England that I know that, that do that for people. So, yeah. Although I've had stuff built in, in Eastern European countries that just, I, where I've been absolutely thrilled with the build quality. Yep. And, and it was worth you know the extra shipping time. Yeah. So for me, proximity doesn't matter as much as the person. Um, um, I've been using Gaz Luke in England quite a bit actually, and I like him a lot. Gaz is good. Um, yeah. If you want to get in touch, uh, divkidvideo.com has a, a contact page. You can use that one. Um, Brian and Dan in the chat asked, "How are you integrating the black box?" We covered that a little bit, but are you? How's the audio? Is it just audio out? Are you bringing stereo audio in to the WMD mixer? Yeah. I, it, the black box has three stereo outs, and one stereo out is, you know, destined to always be a particular stereo channel on the WMD yeah. mixer. And then the other two stereo outs I'll play around with. I'll take the second stereo out and just put it into the B inputs on the WMD mixer if I want to bring up a second layer. Mm. And then the third stereo out, I'm actually using as two mono outputs. And I'll use that for signals that I want to send through other modules, like filters and things like that. So I'll purposely put top loops. When I was trying to play the voice earlier, I realized I had it mapped to three left out. That's why you couldn't hear it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I've got something that I'll put through filters and have filtered versions of top loops and things like that to blend in. So I am definitely taking advantage of the stereo outs on it. Yeah. We did have a question asking where people can find your music, and I did share, I'll share it again, uh, the Data Cult Audio podcast uh, has a whole episode, a whole, what would you call it? 
collection, uh, a, set. a set, yeah, a set of four pieces, yeah, yeah uh, that are all they were all done with an earlier version of that particular case, and all done live in real time, and you know, except for a couple of ambiences I dubbed in later because they were hard to mix. Um, one of the, this year's projects pre coronavirus was to get an alias zone page going up on Bandcamp because that was the ensemble I used to play with in L.A. And there is actually an, an Alias Zone album floating around out there that won best ambient album of the ambient new age album of the year when it came out. Um, but it's very different than what you hear me doing now. It's playing with a band with mm. a keyboardist and a bassist and a flautist and things like that. Um, and me doing a lot of stuff in Ableton Live. Actually, back then, Studio 440, um, then processed through those two racks of gear I had where I would do a live reggae dub style mixing with lots of echoes and timed stuff, things like that going on. So Alias Zone, Lucid Dreams is the uh, CD I did back in, in 2000. And um, I'm going to start an Alias Zone band page with all these different little projects I've got going. But if you become a Patreon follower, and you only have to become a follower for one month, I've been putting up there jams I've done with other people, such as um, Pete Grenader, um, Joe Fraser, Abe Mora. You know, whenever I've been out jamming, I then put it up on my Patreon page with a full breakdown and timing chart. This is what I'm doing at this particular point in time, et cetera, mm. to clue people into the live performance aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, Derek, to follow up on that, any scheduled future collaborations? <sighs> Coronavirus just screwed everything up. Yeah. Um, Not at the minute. I, I was sc- scheduled to go back to L.A., Earlier this year, do more sessions with Jill Fraser. Uh, I was going to do some sessions with Richard Bug. Richard Bug still has a huge modular Moog and Emu system with an Emu um, digital sequencer that he plays live with. And we, in January, started exploring hooking up the TARDIS with his system. And we were going. The plan was to develop it as a duo to play around LA, and that's obviously been screwed up. So those are the biggies. Um, I do play with Jim Coker in Meridian Alpha, which occasionally has a guitarist, Jason Fink. I'm going to another post-coronavirus thing is Jason on guitar, doing loopy ambient stuff with my beats. is something I want to do. So, But in general, I just love jamming with people. I mean, whenever I come to a city, I probably have the TARDIS with me. And I just love setting up jam sessions and just going out and playing with people. Yeah. Yeah. I, to, I mean, yeah virus has thrown a pole spanner in everything in that regard yeah uh, jeff check did ask earlier on uh, please talk about burst generators um yeah burst generators they're not in your case um, you said but we can speak generally about bursts yeah as you you know the idea of a burst generator is to take one trigger in and then send several triggers back out again those triggers might be a musical division they may be on their own timing it depends on the generator and how you have it set up so for people who like dense stuff, machine gun, blast, or rapid fire percussion, particularly higher tempo stuff and very dense stuff, um, they're a fun tool to go ahead and fill in spaces and create tons of triggers from an ind- individual trigger. And if you see Richard Devine perform, he'll start sedate and usually ends with lots of burst generators running and lots of filling up the space. As you probably figured out from listening to me today, I'm much more into the holes in between being as important as the beats. And um, so a burst generator hasn't fit into this case because I just, it's not my aesthetic to have a string of 16th notes or untimed triggers. Mm. Works fantastic in other music, particularly up-tempo stuff, et cetera, high energy stuff. Doesn't work for what I do. You had those little kind of skipping ratchets on the vector, on the bass. Well, yeah, that's different. You know, that's in time. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I love that. I do love the skipping ratcheting. I'll do that in a lot of my sequences. Just mm. yeah. And you can set up a, a burst generator with to do two bursts on one trigger. But a lot of people tend to use them for much more of the overkill, like sort yeah. of stuff rather than like the roll turp- type of thing yeah. rather than an additional beat. Mm. Yeah, uh, Bufaco burst. Is, but that's all I'll say on that. Go get a Bufaco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason I say that, uh, j- just to, um, I will find the video which I did share earlier. But let's also just take a look on their site just really quick. Um, the where is it? Bufaco.org, which now looks nice with their banana nuts on everything. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a little jealous. There we go. There's the burst. So the the reason I bring this one up 
isn't because I'm streaming with them on Friday and it's not because they build mutes for me, which makes me very happy. Um, <laughs> what this one does really nicely, it's clock based, but will also do uh, ramps and uh, reverse ramps in tempo as well. So you can have a quantity of in time rhythmic bursts that's clocked and it will divide and multiply the clock. But you can also have them speed up so you can get that. Or oh, okay. it will slow down. So that's then pushing them off the grid. But for things like a, a reverse into a clap, that that quickly fire into something, you can CV the quantity of the ratchets. You can fire them with the button. There's an end of output. So at the end of the burst, you may trigger another event happening. Or I really like the end of cycle out, triggering a sample and hold to then feed the quantity of the next one. And that may not come round again for a while because I may not be triggering the burst, but just every time it happens, some attenuated amount of little bursts coming in um, just works incredibly well. Yeah, that's nice. The little details get thrown into stuff. Yeah, yeah, and the video... I, I can see that. Video link is there if anyone wants to check that out. Um, final couple of questions. Um, why do we need all logic for triggers when you could just mix them or even just put them in a mult? Okay. Um, some modules you can just mult together the logic and some you cannot. So make sure you've read the manual on your trigger output generator that it will allow you just to mult its outputs together. Some are protected, some are won't. And when you plug outputs to outputs, you can blow up things inside your module. Um, but also, that's only giving you an OR gate, which is useful. But I also sometimes use AND gates. And AND gates are more complex logic that can be done than just using a mult or a simple mixer like that. And then I also want things like inverters or flip-flops, which you cannot do just by patching together. So that is a really quick way of ORing together multiple patterns. But for me, quite often, it's thinning stuff out as much as it is adding things together. And the OR gate adds things together, and ironically, the AND gate thins stuff out by saying you and you both have to, ha have to happen for this to happen. So for those other more advanced logic functions, that's why I have a logic module. And you know, I'm using one that takes up a fair amount of space. I had a 2HP, just an OR and an AND in there, but I found that I needed more. Sometimes I want two AND gates on a particular piece. Sometimes I need an inverter for what I want to do. So that's why I've jumped to having a larger logic module in the case. Yeah. Um, Eric uh, Prem asked, uh, forgot to look during the jam, but what was the output module you were using? And to follow up, is the module choices in your case, are the module choices in your case, I should say, a case of this being travel kit, or are these some of your favorites? Um, first one is I just take direct output from the uh, performance mixer. Even though they come up on 3.5 millimeter jacks, it actually has plus four output. Yeah on its output jacks. So for a while, I was running through a happy nerding isolator mm -hmm. just to give me transformer isolation and be able to have an additional level adjustment. But I found that the places I was playing did not need the isolation. So to save the HP, I'm just taking direct out from the performance mixers out. And it's, you know, it's pretty darn hot output, actually. It'll overdrive a plus four board easily as well and has a volume control, so lots of range. Um, this case started as the idea of, well, you know, I'm getting tired of tearing apart my main case every time I go out somewhere. Let's take my leftover modules and build up a portable case that I can go take with me. And it did start as a ragtag collection of what was left over from the big case. Um, but as time's gone on and as I've played with it more, it's gotten more and more honed down and refined of like, not this module, but this variation on that module. I need this module as well to do this new idea I have. Need room, that module comes out. So it started as just leftovers. Now it's like every module has been sweated over to do the things I want it to do to make my live performance easier. Um, are you working on your next module, the div kick, perhaps? <laughs> uh, no. Um, yes, I'm working on new modules, but no, uh, not the div kick. No drum modules at all, actually. In fact, no, bar a little bit of text in my kind of master module ideas uh, notes, there's very little on drum modules. Not because I don't like them or don't use them, it's just not where my focus has been. The next thing from me will probably come out start of next year. Um, we're, we're a good way off. Um, and I'm not looking to do it 
too kind of regularly. I like the letting things breathe. I, I, we've, we like to take our time. Even mutes as simple as it is took a long time. Oct was relatively quick because Jason was kind of so heavy in Luber and Arbor, the intro modules, that I think a simple little analog LFO was just this breather that he needed. <laughs> so it kind of got <laughs> fast-tracked right through. Um, Oct came about from me sketching out text and a quick kind of Photoshop mock-up. Sent them to Jason. It was a case of, yeah, I can get this up on a board quickly. Um, come up, went up to Glasgow, spent a couple of days with them. Not that long after an octa existed, um, but, it's, but you spent a little bit of time tuning the the relative tempos or the speeds of the different LFOs just to to break up patterns and to get a feel that you liked. If I remember, yeah, correctly. we were doing that remotely, and I was doing it in software so I could give him frequency readings. Um, just LFOs on the synths that are built into Logic, for example. It's like okay, got the, like point seven hertz against like point four is nice, and Jason was kind of fine tuning, and then it was a just come up. Come up and stay for a couple of days, and we'll 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 do it, and we'll patch it. And I need to do a video on what, what was the patch that defined Oct, which was the CSL, uh, the Trig filter, all Instruo modules, and it might have been the U clouds that Key and Instruo built. And it was all eight LFOs modulating the FM, the folding, the symmetry of the folding, level of the sub through of ECA filtering one of the waves, all of these shifting back against each other. And that was that magic moment. So I need to just, I have a picture of it on my phone. I need to rebuild that as best I can. Like that was the defining moment of, of where that came from. Not to talk it up too much, but it is a relatively simple thing, but with a really kind of key musical intention. Random step took a long time um, on Andrew because I, I didn't do any of the engineering and he did tremendous work on random step to get that level of kind of performance in the hold, how long it will hold before voltages droop, and the accuracy of the pass-through uh, certainly comes at a high component cost and a hell of a lot of time and experience from Andrew. He does really good work. So that took a while. Um, but I also like to live with things. You know, Oct felt right straight away, more complex ideas. I'm in no rush. Um, so no, long, long answer, no div kick. <laughs> Um, do I create the PCBs myself, Nick? No, I don't. I, I can't lay PCBs out. So that's where this collaboration comes in. And also, I like working with other people. I have no real intention to stop and kind of set up from scratch myself. It's really nice to work with people and kind of all play on each other's it's nice strengths. To it's nice to find an engineer that you can collaborate with because a lot of these modules are people's personal visions and dreams and they don't want outside influence. You know, they have something in their head they want to get out. So it's nice to find engineers that you can work with and shape something and throw ideas and they don't take offense, you know, that you're not following their vision and they're willing to try it. Um, I'm just going to be starting beta development on another module where I love working with that particular engineer and I'm actually looking forward to it rather than it being like, okay, just hunting bugs is all we're doing here, right? Mm. Uh, it's funny, the div kid head on the top of mutes uh, on the bottom of mutes, but the top of the others annoys me. Um, yeah, <laughs> the fact that one's coppery coloured and one's white, and they're different sizes. Um, maybe that maybe ah. that will even out o as um, OCD. Yeah, yeah, OCD. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that will even out as there's more of them at the top and bottom in the future. I was very happy for mutes to look like Bafaco. I wasn't trying to hide it. I'm very happy that Oct looks like Instro and that Random Step is SSF. They're all part of those companies as well. Um, am I going to stray from 4HP? Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I'm not, it isn't a 4HP company in the sense that 2HP are all 2HP. Uh, yeah, maybe. But this is all things for the future. I'm, I'm certainly, I have nothing to reveal if I wanted to other than ideas, and they're way too early. A brief start of next year, I think. Um, so, yeah. Any news about Synthplex, Chris? It has been rescheduled to be late October, and we've not heard any updates since then. Unfortunately, California's had, particularly Southern California, where Synthplex happens, has had very persistent problems in trying to flatten their curve of outbreaks. So I'm not hopeful at this point that it's going to happen, which is unfortunate because I lived in L.A. for over 20 years. I have a lot of friends back there, so I always go tack on another week and go play with people and stuff like that. But 
you know, we're, we're at the mercy of this stupid virus and people's ability to show some discipline to help tamp it out. Uh, cool. I think we're there for questions, so let's do it as a last call, last orders at the bar. Um, any final questions? There is still, I, I would presume, still a third second delay, so we'll give you a minute for any final questions. We've hit our magic three hours. That's where we kind of seem to sit. <laughs> but uh, Went over today. Yeah, yeah, a little over today. Is that extra jam that got thrown in? That threw me off guard. What? Play? Huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and my, whatever happened to my audio? Um, I'm not sure with that one. Hmm. Anyway, we survived another one. Thanks, everyone, for participating. I only had a chance when one of the pre-recorded demos was playing back to go glance at the chat pod, and it was flying past. I went, oh, my God. <laughs> um, but it's fantastic that, that people are into it and people want to share information. And uh, for my Patreon followers, I will definitely be doing an annotated version of this as the other broadcast of where everything happens in time and answering some additional questions that maybe didn't get answered today. But thanks, everyone. For participating, because um, although Ben and I enjoy chatting with each other, um, it makes it special to be able to do this for hundreds of people. Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, I'll put Chris's Patreon link in there one more time. Thank you to everyone that donated Super Chats, where you donate money during the live stream. I will find a way for that to benefit Chris and I. What that is, I don't know. Maybe if he makes it over to Leeds, <laughs> I'll we'll, we'll post pictures of a meal that I go by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll go um, for curry. But... Good slap up, you yeah, got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be there next year. I'm confident I'll be there next yeah, year. Yeah, it all gets put back in to to what we're doing. So, uh, how do you set a bipolar LFO like Oct with an e with a VCA? Um, I presume that question means you'd want Oct to be unipolar, because if you plug into a normal VCA with something bipolar to CV control it, not the input into the VCA it will automatically halfway rectify and it will ignore all of the negative voltage. You could offset it and attenuate it, which is why utilities are so good. So you, you push that bipolar wave up above the zero line and then you scale it as, as you need it. Or you could rectify it, which will take the wave and kind of flip um, that way. <laughs> that, will, that will flip <laughs> the wave up. So look at rectifiers or offset and attenuate and in particular full wave rectifiers full wave yes. rectifiers are the ones that flip half waves are doing what the vca is doing just cutting off the bottom half yep um any more episodes this was the final episode of the tardis the other episodes will be linked below um that's as much for now as we'll go into chris's live case as i say we are looking at more of the kind of feeding the space case i call my live case the cosmic space case because oh, it's too heavy i'm not going to pick it up uh, <laughs> Because <laughs> like, you'd be like hiding back with his test equipment. Um, yeah, it's too heavy to go grab that from under the desk. It's painted not that dissimilar to the background on this live stream. Um, I had a graffiti artist, artist friend that also does a lot of great uh, brushwork, um, do a kind of cosmic space scene on the case. So we'll maybe do that. Um, I may have monster cases in the future, plural. Uh, we'll We'll see. But let us know. Um, you can find us wherever yeah. you find us and make suggestions. Certainly on Patreon, that gets a lot of my time. I know Chris spends a lot of his time with his community there as well. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah, Ben and I have tossed around the idea of doing some more patch-oriented shows and maybe particularly doing it as a stream for patrons or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some maybe some kind of monthly. We both build a patch and discuss it. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we, we, we're throwing ideas around. My next yeah. live stream will be this Friday at 8 p.m. with Bafaco for CV thing. I'll have a demo going up Friday afternoon. I'll be working on that again tomorrow. And then a stream, hangout Friday evening. Um, I know that there's Jose and Manu from Bafaco, and I believe Jose is manning the synth. So it should be fun. Um, I won't be manning a synth. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll have the demo which i can cut into the video and last time we did a stream for a new release was per call with bufaco and it's fun just to hang out to see familiar faces from this live chat and to catch up with them as well get some kind of humility into it humanity into it um rather than just the demo itself so yeah friday 8 p.m there'll be links set up on my channel uh, that's uk bst time zone which would be 9 p.m central europe uh, that'll be noon 
um, West Coast, PDT in the USA, and 3 p.m. East Coast, EDT. Uh, beyond that, once I set the YouTube link up, if you look tomorrow on my channel, the link will tell you what that time is in your local time zone, which is handy. Great. Well, that's it for questions. Chris, thank you so much for your time, effort, energy, passing on experience and skills, ideas. Oh, happy to share. Really, really good. Um, any links anybody wants, leave a comment on the video. We can both come back and respond with anything to follow up. Great. All right, let's leave it there. And um, we'll Take care. Enjoy the rest of your week, everyone. And um, maybe catch you on one of Ben's streams later this week. Yeah. See you later. Bye.